Hey everybody, it's your bro, hope you're doing well, and in today's video I'm going to teach you guys everything you need to know to get started working with PHP. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. If you would like to be notified if I release new courses in the future, be sure to subscribe, because I kind of release them randomly. That is all. PHP is a server-side scripting language. It's used to build dynamic web pages. It runs on a server, not the user's web browser. Although haters say PHP is dead, it's still used on 70% of all known websites. I don't know, that doesn't sound dead to me. Many developers prefer PHP for its speed, simplicity, and flexibility. It's a popular choice for small businesses and freelancers, especially since in the news lately you hear about layoffs in the tech industry. PHP was released in 1995. It was originally an acronym for Personal Homepage but that was later changed to PHP Hypertext Preprocessor to reflect the language's evolution. In fact, PHP was never intended to be a new programming language. It grew organically and out of control until it became the behemoth that it is today. Fun fact, the mascot of PHP is an elephant which is named Elephant? Ella php -fant? I don't know. How I would describe the basics of PHP is as follows. A browser sends a request to a server. PHP on that server processes that request. Then the server sends HTML back to the browser. Our server running PHP can even communicate to a database, then back to the web browser. PHP is most commonly used with relational databases such as MySQL, Postgres, and Oracle. PHP can be written alongside with HTML. Before beginning the series, you'll want to have a solid foundation on HTML. You will need to know MySQL, but that won't be until about video 20. For your web server, I recommend XAMPP. XAMPP is a cross-platform web server solution stack. It's basically a software suite. It contains an Apache server, MySQL, and PHP. You'll also need some sort of text editor. Where are you going to write the code? VS Code tends to be the most popular nowadays, and that's what I use for my own personal projects. We'll write our code with VS Code, then run our code on our XAMPP server since we can't run it on a web browser. I'll show you how we can download both the XAMPP server and the VS Code text editor. Now we will begin the installation process of a server that we can execute PHP code within. Go to this URL, apachefriends.org. Like I said before, PHP code is executed on a server and returned to a web browser. Click on one of the relevant download links for your operating system. I'm running Windows. I will download the Windows version. Okay, for me, the installation process has started and it's done. So let's open it. For setup, we're going to click Next. All we really need is MySQL and PHP My Admin. It looks like PHP is already selected for us. Then next, remember this file location. My folder containing all of my XAMPP files is located in my C drive. Next, you can select a language. I'll pick English. Next, and give it a minute. Do you want to start the control panel now? We might as well. And finish. Here's the control panel for my XAMPP server. We will start the Apache service. If everything works, the Apache module is highlighted green. That means it's working. If you ever need to stop this module, you can hit the stop button. Let's start MySQL as well. And our MySQL server is working. If you see any red text within this log, that means there is an error. If you run into any problems, just check to see what that error was. But everything for me is running fine. This control panel will run behind the scenes. I can close out of it, but it's still running, which is important. Hey, this is Bro from the Future. I forgot to mention in this video that if you ever shut down your computer, you will have to open up the control panel again and restart these services. Yeah, I forgot to mention that, so be sure to do that. Now that our XAMPP server is downloaded, we will need that VS Code text editor. I'm assuming that some of you have that downloaded already, but if you don't, here's how. If you need a text editor, I recommend Visual Studio Code. If you're interested in downloading this text editor, head to this URL, code.visualstudio.com. I'm going to click this blue download button. Select the correct download link for my operating system. I'm running Windows. I will select this one. Then we will run this executable. Accept the license agreement. Yes, I did read it that fast. You do have the option of selecting a destination location. I'll keep it as the default. Next, next, I'll create a desktop icon, then next, and install. 
We might as well launch VS Code, then finish. I have VS Code open along with the modern web browser. I'm using Google Chrome in the series. We're going to create a new file within our XAMPP folder. So let's open a folder. Remember that file path for the XAMPP server? That's where you're going to look. For me, that was in my C drive. Go to XAMPP. Under htdocs, we're going to create a new folder. New folder. I'll name this folder website to contain my website stuff. Then I will select folder. Within my website folder, I'm going to create a new file. I will name this file index.php. The reason that I'm naming this file index is because that is the default for a home page. So we now have a PHP file. In VS Code, if you're receiving a warning that states cannot validate since a PHP installation could not be found, we need to validate the executable path of the PHP executable found within our XAMPP server. To do that, we're going to find our settings file. It's a JSON file. PHP validate executable path. Edit in the settings JSON file. Let me maximize this. Next to PHP validate executable path, we need to find the file path to the PHP executable. Again, within my C drive, within my XAMPP folder, go to PHP, then copy this file path for the executable. I'll right click, go to properties, copy this location, close out of this window, paste that executable path, then add php.exe. Then these may have to be forward slashes. Let's save. On Windows, you can press Control S to save. Close out of these settings, and that warning goes away. I also recommend a few extensions. The first extension is PHP IntelliFence. It should be this one. It gives you access to a few tools that are useful for PHP development. Let's install that plugin. Then look up the live server extension. It offers a live reload feature. Then lastly, PHP server. It allows you to serve your project with PHP. Those are the three extensions that I recommend. All right, we are now ready to get started. In a web browser to access your XAMPP server, you can type local host as the URL. This will bring you to the XAMPP dashboard. We would like to access the website folder of the XAMPP server. So let's add localhost slash the name of that folder, website. Our PHP code will execute on the server and be returned to this web browser, whatever the output is. To write some PHP code, type left angle bracket, question mark, PHP. Wherever our PHP code ends, type question mark, right angle bracket. Our PHP code will be between these two angle brackets. To display a message, you can type echo, either single quotes or double quotes, then a semicolon at the end. A semicolon is kind of like the period at the end of a sentence in English. I will type a message. I like pizza. To save, you can go to the top, file, save, or use the shortcut, which I'll be using. So for me, that's control S. If I were to reload this web page, it displays my message. I like pizza. To make your life a lot easier, we can add a live server extension to your web browser. Currently, I'm using Chrome. To add a live server extension, I'm going to go to Settings, Extensions, Open Chrome Web Store, then search Live Server. And that should be this one. Add to Chrome, Add Extension. Let's close out of these tabs. 
I'm going to go to Extensions, select Live Server Web Extension, enable Live Reload. We'll need the actual server address as well as your live server address. This URL is the actual server address. If you're on a Mac, it may contain a port number such as 8080. So let's copy this address, go to extensions, then add the actual server address. Now we need the live server address. To find this, we can go to VS Code, press this Go Live button, There should be a new tab that pops up. Copy this address. That is the live server address. Then we will paste it within the live server address of this live server web extension. Then press apply. You may need to restart your web browser as well. All right, that was localhost slash website. You know what? I don't just like pizza, I love pizza. If I were to save this file, it should update automatically. See within our website, it now says I love pizza. Let's add a second line with echo. Echo, double quotes, add a semicolon to the end. Let's add another line. It's really good. The output is all on one line. To add a line break, Within your set of quotes, you can add a break tag. I love pizza. It's really good. To add a comment, a comment is used as a note for yourself or other developers. All you have to type is double forward slashes, then some message. This is a comment. Our comment is not displayed as output. It's mostly just used for notes. For a multi-line comment, you would type forward slash asterisk. That will begin a multi-line comment. This is a multi-line comment. The end of our PHP script is currently green. That means it's being included within this multi-line comment. Wherever you need your multi-line comment to end, you would type asterisk, then forward slash. The end of the script is blue again, and you can see that this multi-line comment isn't being displayed as output. Now the cool thing about PHP files is that they can contain HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and well of course PHP. So I will also include some HTML code within this PHP file. So in VS Code, to generate some boilerplate code, you can type exclamation point and then tab. We now have some HTML markup within our PHP file. Within the body of our document, I'll add maybe a button. I'll create a button to order a pizza. I should probably precede this button with a line break. So there's our button. It currently doesn't do anything. But that's just a demonstration that you can include more than just PHP code within a PHP file. Alright everybody, so that is an introduction to PHP. In the next video, we'll discuss variables. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, please let me know by smashing that like button, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. Well, hello everybody, welcome to lesson 2. Today I'm going to discuss variables in PHP. A variable... Think of it as a reusable container that holds data. We give that container a name. That is the variable name. There's different data types we'll discuss. They include, but are not limited to, strings, integers, floats, and booleans. There are still more than this, but these are a few of the basics for beginners. Let's get started. To declare a variable, you type a dollar sign, then a unique variable name. I'm going to store a user's name. A unique identifier could be just name. I will set this variable name equal to a string of text. So place your string of text within a set of double quotes. Add a semicolon to the end because we always do that. Why don't you enter in your first name? Then to display this variable as output, we can type our echo statement 
then add the variable name. So type dollar sign name semicolon. Let's save. And there is our name rendered as HTML. The data type of this variable is a string. It's a string of text and it can include spaces. Add a space followed by your last name. As output, we're displaying my first name and my last name, all as one long string of text. If you echo a message directly, that is known as a string literal. I will display a message such as, hello, then I want to add this variable name. The easiest way to do that is to add a set of curly braces as a placeholder, and within the curly braces, add your variable name. So dollar sign, name. Hello, whatever your name is. Let's add a few more variables. How about a food variable? What's a food you like? I like pizza, of course, which we learned from the last video. Hello, name. I'll display another message. Echo, you like, at our placeholder, our variable name, food. Let's save. I'm going to disable this. Page is not in Dutch for some reason. Our output is all on one line. I'm just going to add a line break. Hello, bro code. You like pizza. What's another example of a string? Maybe an email. Let's declare our variable, which we will name email. Add a set of quotes, semicolon to the end. Uh, fake at gmail.com. So let's add another line break. Let's echo your email is at our placeholder for a variable, then our variable name, email. Your email is fake at gmail.com. That's the string data type. It's just a series of text. Your text can contain numbers such as fake123 at gmail.com. So even though these are numbers, we treat them more as characters. We can't use these for any sort of math. That's where our next data type comes in. Integers, whole integers. An example of a whole integer would be somebody's age. Let's say that I'm 21. Age equals 21. I'm not 21 anymore, but I like to think that I still am. The data contained within this variable age is an integer. We don't have any quotes around this number. I will echo my age variable. Echo, you are our variable age years old. Let me add a line break here. There, you are 21 years old. An int is simply a whole integer. You know, somebody wouldn't be like half a year old, like 21.5. An age would be a whole number. Another example of a whole integer variable could be users. Let's create a variable named users, and there are maybe two users online. You wouldn't have half a user. Users would be a whole number. Let's echo the amount of users. There are, at a placeholder, our variable users online. There are two online. After the variable users, let's add the word users. There are two users online. One more example of a whole integer could be a quantity. You wouldn't have half a product, you would have a whole product. Let's create a variable named quantity. I'll just set it to three. Okay, let's echo. You would like to buy our variable quantity 
items. Then a line break. You would like to buy three items. Okay, those are whole integers. Let's discuss floats next. A float is a floating point number. It's a number that contains a decimal portion. These variables are ints, integers, they're whole numbers. An example of a float could be a grade point average. Maybe my grade point average is 2.5. So let's echo. Your GPA is then our GPA variable. Then line break. Your GPA is 2.5. I think we're getting the hang of this. I'm going to speed things up. Another float could be a price. With American currency, a price contains dollars and cents, with the cents being a decimal portion. Suppose a pizza is $4.99. Let's echo. Your pizza is, I'll add my price variable, your pizza is price. Line break. Your pizza is $4.99. I'm going to add the dollar sign before $4.99. But we have a problem. PHP is getting confused because we precede our variable names with the dollar sign. Undefined variable, $4.99. If you would like to display a dollar sign as output, you need an escape sequence. I will precede my dollar sign with a backslash. Then it works just fine. Let me add your. Your pizza is $4.99. So that's another example of a floating point number, a float. Another could be a tax rate. Tax rate. I'll make up a tax rate, like a sales tax rate. 5.1 sounds good. Let's echo the sales tax rate is... Tax rate, oops, I'm forgetting a dollar sign. Tax rate percent, then a line break. The sales tax rate is 5.1%. Those are floats, floating point numbers. They're numbers that contain a decimal portion. Integers are whole numbers. The last data type we'll cover are Booleans. Booleans are either true or they're false. It's like a light switch. It can only be on or off. So what are some variables that could be considered Booleans? What if somebody is employed? They either are employed or they're not. Employed equals true. Another could be online. Is somebody online or offline? Maybe a user's offline. I will set that to be false. What about for sale? Something is for sale or it's not for sale. I'll set that to be true. Now with booleans, when you display them as output, you don't see true or false. Rather, this is what you see. Let's echo online status colon. Then I'll add my boolean variable online. So online is false. Online status, and then nothing appears. Boolean values, when you output them, if it's false, it doesn't display anything. However, if online was true, that will output a 1. 1 means true, 0 means false. However, we won't display 0. Nothing is displayed for false. Usually with Boolean variables, we don't normally display them as output. We use them internally within a program. We might use these within an if statement or a loop, which we'll discuss in the future. But at this point, you should be aware of the existence of Boolean variables. In summary, a Boolean variable is either true or false. I'm going to get rid of these echo statements. 
you can mix and match variables when you display output with echo. I will add two variables this time. Here's a hypothetical situation. You own a pizza restaurant and somebody places an online order for a given amount of pizzas. You have ordered, let's add our variable quantity, x, then our variable food. You have ordered 3x pizza. Let's add an s to the end to make it plural. You have ordered 3x pizzas. Then let's calculate a total. What I'm going to do now is declare a variable, but I'm not going to assign it a value quite yet. We will calculate a total. Total equals null. Null means no value. We'll add a value later. After displaying our message, you have ordered quantity x food. Let's reassign our total variable equal to our quantity times to use multiplication, you use an asterisk. Our variable price. So now our total should contain a number. Let's output it. Echo. Your total is. Let's add our variable. Total. And see what we have. Ooh, I need a line break. I'm forgetting about that. You have ordered 3x pizzas. Your total is $14.97. So I need to add a dollar sign, or you can pick some other unit of currency. However, PHP is currently confused because we're preceding our placeholder with a dollar sign. So I need to use an escape sequence. Your total is $14.97. Now in my program, if I were to change the quantity, well, this total is going to be updated. Four pizzas is $19.96. If I were to change the price, that would also be reflected. Now the total is $23.96. All right, everybody, so those are variables. They are just a named container for storing reusable data. There are a few different data types. Strings, which are a series of text. Ints, which are whole integers floats, which are floating point numbers, and booleans, which are either true or false. In the next topic, we'll have more practice with arithmetic and PHP. And well, those are variables in PHP. Hello everybody, so in today's topic, I'm going to be discussing some basic arithmetic in PHP. I'll divide this video into different sections. First, we have arithmetic operators, then the increment and decrement operators, followed by operator precedence. Let's begin with arithmetic operators. In my example, we have three variables, x, x will equal a number like 10. Then we have y, which I'll set to be 2, then z. We'll assign z a value later, I will set that to be null. If I would like to add x and y together, then store the result within z, we'll have to use some addition. I could write something like this. z equals our variable x plus our variable y. Then I will echo whatever z is. So 10 plus 2, that's 12. So that's addition. I'll go through these pretty quick. They're fairly straightforward. So 10 minus y would be Subtraction, x minus y, store the result in z, the result is 8. Now multiplication, that is an asterisk. 10 times 2 is 20. Division is a forward slash. 10 divided by 2, that is 5. To raise a base to a given power, you use double asterisks. 10 to the power of 2 is 100. 10 times 10 is 100. Then we have the modulus operator. That will give you the remainder of any division. x modulus y. While 10 divides by 2 evenly, the remainder is 0. 
if y was 3, imagine that we have a group of 10 students, and they need to break into groups of 3, there's going to be one student that's remaining. So, the percent sign, the modulus operator, gives you the remainder of any division. It's really helpful for determining if a number is even or odd. You would just say modulus 2. If the remainder is 1, that number is odd. If it's 0, then it's even. So those are basic arithmetic operators. Now we'll cover increment and decrement operators. I have a variable which we will name counter. I will set counter to be 0 to begin with. If I need to increment this variable by 1, as if we're counting, normally I would have to write an expression such as this. Our counter equals our counter plus 1. Then let's echo our counter variable. So the result is 1. This can be cumbersome to write. A shortcut you could do if incrementing a variable by 1 is replace this part of our expression with plus plus. Take the variable, then add plus plus. That will increment your variable by 1. Plus plus is the increment operator. For decrement, you would use minus minus. Our counter is now at negative 1. If I were to set our counter to 10, after decrementing, it's now 9. Use plus plus to increment, minus minus to decrement. You can increment by a given value too. If I would like to count by 2's, let's set counter to be 0. Instead of plus plus, you would write plus equals then some number. Counter plus equals 2 will increment my variable by 2 plus equals 3 would be 3. On the flip side, to decrement by a given value, you would use minus equals some number. So 0 minus equals 2 will decrement my variable by 2. Minus equals 3 would be, well, 3. So that is the increment and decrement operators. Lastly, we have operator precedence. Given a complex arithmetic expression such as this example, in which order do we solve each part of this expression? We would begin with parentheses. Beginning from left to right, if there's anything within parentheses, we would solve that first. For example, with my expression, let's echo whatever the total currently is. So the total for me is 2.999. Beginning from left to right, solve anything within parentheses first. We currently don't have any parentheses. Then comes any exponents. So beginning from left to right, look for any exponents. We do have 5 to the power of 6. Let's see what that is. 5 to the power of 5. Do it a third time, fourth time, fifth time, sixth time. 15,625. Beginning from left to right, solve any multiplication, division, then modulus. Modulo, is that the right term? So we have addition. Subtraction, here we go, we have multiplication. 3 times 4, that's 12. Then we have division. 12 divided by 15,625 is 0 0.000768. Then lastly, addition and subtraction. We have some addition, 1 plus 2 is 3. 3 minus this number, 0 0.000768 is our result. 2.999232. That's operator precedence. If you have a complex equation, solve anything within parentheses first, then any exponents, multiplication, division, modulus, then lastly, addition and subtraction. All right, everybody, in conclusion, we have discussed arithmetic operators, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, exponents, and modulus. Increment to decrement operators, you can take a variable, add plus plus to increment it, or minus minus to decrement it. Then lastly, operator precedence. And well everybody, that is basic arithmetic in PHP. Hey again everybody, it's me, and in today's topic I'm going to explain the get and post variables in PHP. Get and post are both special variables. Technically, they're super global variables, but that's a topic for another day. Just think of them as special variables for now. These variables are used to collect data from an HTML form. If you have an opening form tag in HTML, 
you can use the action attribute, then send some data to some PHP file, whatever you list here. There's two different methods, get and post. They each have their own advantages and disadvantages, which we'll discuss later. For the time being, before our PHP script, let's create an HTML document in VS Code. To do that, you would type exclamation point, then hit tab. Then be sure to follow our HTML document with a PHP script. Then I'm going to open up a web browser. In our HTML document, we're going to create a form. A user is going to type in a username, a password, then to log in, they're going to hit a login button. Let's create that. We'll need a label to begin with. We'll need to close the label. I'll add a line break. The label will say user name. Then we'll add a text box. Use the input tag. It's a self-closing tag. Add a line break. Within the input tag, we will set the type to equal text because it's a text box. Then we will set the name to be user name. Let's copy our label and our text box. Paste these two lines again, but change username to password this time. The type will be password. The name will be password. So you can type something into your username. If you were to type within the password box, it should be hidden, which is good. Then lastly, we'll add a button. We'll use a self-closing input tag. The type will be submit. It's a submit button. The value is the text on the button. Let's set that to be log in. So we have a button, but it currently doesn't do anything. We will enclose all of our elements within a form tag. Be sure to open it, then close it. I will indent all of this. Within my opening form tag, I will set the action attribute to be a file in which I want to send this data to. I will send this data to the PHP script of the same file. So my file is index.php. I will list that here, index.php. If you had a separate PHP file, you would just change the file name to reflect that, or the file path. Then we will set the method attribute to be either get or post. We'll begin with get. So let's type in a username, make up a password, and this still doesn't do anything. Within our PHP script, we're going to utilize the get variable because we're using the get method. Let's echo, then type dollar sign underscore the word get. So get is a special type of variable. It can hold more than one value. If you're familiar with arrays, it's technically an array. Within get, we have both a username and a password. I would like just the username. To get just the username, after the get variable, add a set of square brackets, then within a set of quotes, type in the name of the information you're getting. I would like the username. Let's see what happens. I'm going to save, type in a username, make up a password, log in, and there's my username. Now let's do this with the password as well. Echo get password. So let's refresh everything. I'll make up a username, type in a password. There's my username, there's my password. I'm going to put my password on a new line. I need a line break. There's a couple of different ways in which we can do this. You can use some string concatenation. One way to do that is to type dot followed by a line break within quotes. I'll do that for the second line as well. So that would work. My preferred method is to do something like this. I'm going to surround my get variable with quotes, then add a set of curly braces around our get variable. Then add a line break. Bro, make up a password, log in, there we are. If using the get variable and you need to add a line break, this is my preferred way, although there's more than one way. Use whatever suits you. Now with get, we have one problem. If we were to take a look at the URL of this document, when using the get method of a form, any data sent over to a PHP form is appended to the URL. 
username equals bro and password equals pizza123. There's no security because we're appending some sensitive information, such as a password, to the URL. That's where post comes in. I will change the method to post. Let's see what happens. I'll type in my first name, make up a password, and log in. So we have an undefined array key. If you're using the post method, let's change get to be post. Make up a username, type in a password, log in. There's my username, there's my password. And if I were to take a look at the URL, my sensitive data isn't appended to the URL. The post method is more secure than get, but they each have their own advantages and disadvantages. With the get method, data is appended to the URL. It's not secure. I wouldn't pass any like usernames or passwords using a get method. There's a character limit. However, with the get method, bookmarking a page with values is possible. Get requests can be cached. Get tends to be better for a search page. Now with post, data is packaged inside the body of the HTTP request. It's more secure than get. There's no data limit. Pages involving a post request can't be bookmarked, and the requests are not cached. Post tends to be better for submitting credentials, like a username and a password, any sensitive information. So if security matters, use post. If it doesn't, get might be better. Now let's cover an exercise. Let's clear our PHP form. Then within the body of our document, we will create an order page for a restaurant. We will begin by creating a form. We'll need a pair of form tags, then be sure to close it. Within my opening form tag, I will set the action attribute to be a file or a file location. I will send this data to my index.php file. For the method, let's use post. For my order form, let's create a text box for a quantity. I'll create a label. I'll close it right away. Let's change the text to quantity. Then I'll add a line break. We'll add a text box. Input. The type is text. The name will be quantity. We'll use the input tag. Set the type attribute to be submit. Then value equals, how about total? We're calculating a total. Now within my PHP script, let's say we have a food item. I'll create a variable item equals make up some food like pizza. We'll need a price. Price equals make up a price. $5.99 sounds good. Then a quantity, whatever the user is going to type in. That is found within the post variable dollar sign, underscore, post, add a set of square brackets, semicolon. Within the square brackets, I would like the quantity. Now, this is a personal choice. What I like to do is that if I'm accessing the get or post super variable, I like to store the result within a local variable. So I'm going to create a quantity variable. Quantity equals whatever our quantity is from our HTML form. I find caching one of these values within a local variable more convenient to work with. So let's echo a message, like an order total. You have ordered, let's use our quantity, to T, X, what's our item? Pizzas. Item, I'll add S, because it may be plural. Then we'll calculate a total. Echo. You know what? Let's create a total variable as well. Total, I'll set that to be null because we'll assign a value later. Total equals quantity times variable price. Then we'll echo your total is add a placeholder, our variable total, 
then I will precede our placeholder with the dollar sign. Uh, but we need to use that escape sequence. All right, let's save everything. Enter in a quantity. I want three pizzas. Oh, we need a line break as well. You have ordered 3x pizzas. Your total is $17.97. And if I were to look at the URL, we're using the post method. So our quantity is not going to be appended to the URL. If I were to use get, let's replace post with get. Do that here as well. I'm going to type in three pizzas again. Hit total. I can change the URL to reflect a different quantity, like maybe I want 30 pizzas. Then resubmit. You have ordered 30 pizzas. The grand total is $179.70. That's one of the reasons why post is more secure than get. You can change the URL to reflect a different value. All right, everybody. So that is both the get and post variables in PHP. Hey, if you're enjoying my series so far, let me know by smashing that like button, leave a random comment down below, and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro. Hey everybody, in today's topic, I'm going to explain a few useful math-related functions in PHP that you might be interested in. We'll need an HTML document, followed by a PHP script. We will enter in some user input via an HTML form. So let's create a form in our HTML document. Open it. Close it. We will set the action equal to be our index page. Index.php. For the method, let's use post. Let's create a label. Label. Close it. The label will be x. We'll have a user enter in a number. Then let's add an input tag. It's a self-closing tag. The type will be text. The name will be X. Then we need a submit button. Input type equals submit. For the value, let's say total. It's a total button. That's good enough for now. If I'm using the post super global variable, let's say we need x, type post, add a set of square brackets, we would like the value of x. I will cache this value within a local variable within my PHP script for convenience. Variable x equals whatever value for x that we receive. Just so that we're sure that everything's working fine, let's echo whatever x is. Echo x. So currently there's nothing in there. Let's type three, hit total, and there's our number x, which is three. So here's a few math related functions you may be interested in. The first is the absolute value function. Let's say we have a total variable as well. I'll declare this variable, but not assign it quite yet. I'll set that to be null. Then later on in my program, we can assign total of value. Total equals to find the absolute value of a number, type ABS for absolute value, followed by a set of parentheses, semicolon. Whatever number or variable you put within this function, ABS, it will return the absolute value of that number. We can either put a number in here or a variable. Let's put in X. So variable X. Then I will echo our total. So I'm going to save. I'll type in negative four. This should return positive four, which it does. Negative 100.123. 100.123. That is the absolute value function. Let's cover a few more. We have the round function. We can round a number. Let's assign total equal to use the round function. Then we will pass in our variable x. So let's save again, refresh that. 3.14 rounded is three. 3.99 would be four. Now to always round down, you can use the floor function. So let's copy this line, replace round 
with floor. We will always round down, so 3.99 rounded is 3. 4.99 rounded down is 4. There's also seal, meaning ceiling, which will always round up. Replace floor with seal. Let's save. Refresh everything. 3.14 rounded up is 4. 4.14 rounded up is 5. For this next example, we'll need another number. Let's copy our label and our text box, paste it, replace X with Y, here and here. We'll need two numbers this time. Let's get whatever Y is. So Y equals within the post super global variable, we are looking for Y. We can use the power function to raise a base to a given power. Let's take our total variable equals power. We'll need two numbers or two variables. What is x raised to the power of y? So what is 2 to the power of 3? That would be 8. 2 to the power of 4 is 16. What about 3 to the power of 3? That is 27. 3 to the power of 4, that is 81. That is the power function. You can raise a base to a given power. Then we have square root. I'm going to put that here. Total equals SQRT, add a set of parentheses. Let's find the square root of X. So we don't need Y in this case. What is the square root of 100? That is 10. 144, that is 12. That's the square root function. We will need three variables. Let's create another label and a text box. The third number will be Z. Be sure to change the name too. Then we will create one more variable. Variable Z, post Z. Then we have the max function. Total equals max. Whatever values or variables you place within the max function, the max function will give you the greatest value. What is the maximum number between variables X, Y, and Z? So let's save. I'll refresh that one two three the highest number is three 30 20 10 the highest number is 30 then we do have the min function which will give you the minimum what is the minimum number between 10 20 30 the minimum is 10 3 2 1 the minimum is 1. That's the min function. The next function is an unusual one. It is the pi function. Total equals pi function. So add a set of parentheses. This will print 3.14 and the remaining digits of pi. If you ever need pi, you can use the pi function. The next one's pretty useful. It is the random function. Total equals rand. This will give you a completely random number. I think up to just over 2 billion. Within the parentheses of the rand function, you can list two numbers for a minimum and a maximum. If you're rolling a six-sided dice, the minimum would be 1, the maximum would be 6. So now we're generating a random number between 1 and 6. We can either raise the minimum or raise the maximum. For a random number between 1 and 100, within the rand function, the first digit is 1, the second digit is 100. So we have 10, 85, 17, 84. If I were to raise the minimum, let's say 90, we'll generate a random number between 90 and 100. Maybe you could use this for a game. Now we're going to go over an exercise. For this exercise, we will have a user enter in a radius, the radius of a circle. Using PHP, we will calculate what the circumference would be, the area, and the volume if that radius is for a sphere. So we will need to accept some user input. We'll do that with an HTML form. So within our HTML document, let's create a form, then close it. The action will equal our index.php file. The method will be post. 
we will need a label. Close it. The label will be radius. Let's add a text box. We need a self-closing input tag. The type will be text. The name will be radius because we're accepting a radius. Then a submit button. Input type equals submit. For the value, let's say calculate. That's all we need. Within our PHP script, let's create a local radius variable. We will get the value from this text box via the post super global variable. Let's access the post variable. We are looking for the radius. And now we have a radius. We'll declare a circumference variable. I think that's how to spell circumference. That will be null. To calculate the circumference of a circle, we can follow this formula. Circumference equals 2 times pi. Pi, we can use the pi function, times our variable radius. Then let's echo. Let's say circumference equals add a placeholder, then insert our variable circumference. Let's say that this is in centimeters. Then I'll add a line break. Maybe the radius is 5. I'll calculate that. The circumference is 31.4, and we have a lot of digits after. There's one thing I'm going to change real quick. I'm going to add a line break after our form. For the radius, let's say it's 10. I'm going to hit calculate. Here's our circumference. 62.83 and some change centimeters. We can use the round function to round to a given digit. I would like to round to the second digit after the decimal. Before we display our output, let's reassign circumference equal to use the round function, then pass in our circumference. But I'm going to make one change. Normally, the round function will round a number to the nearest whole integer. To round to a given digit, add a comma then that digit place. Let's round to the second digit. So our circumference is 62.83 centimeters. Let's also calculate the area and the volume. We'll need a area variable. I'll set that to be null. To calculate the area, let's set area equal to, we'll need the pi function, times our radius to the power of two. We can use the power function enter in our radius to the power of 2. Then we can round our area. Area equals round. Within the round function, enter in your area. We would like to round to the second digit after the decimal. Then we will display the area. Area equals our area variable. I think technically, that should be centimeter squared. So let's save. I'll enter in a new radius. Okay, so if our radius is 15 this time, I'll calculate that. With the radius of 15, the circumference is 94.25 centimeters. The area is 706.86 centimeters squared. Now we'll calculate volume if the radius is for a sphere. Volume equals null. Volume equals, here's the formula, 4 divided by 3 times pi function times our radius to the power of 3. We can use the power function. We are raising our radius to the power of 3. Then we will take our volume and round to two decimal places. Volume, comma, Two. Then we will display the result with echo. Volume equals, add a placeholder, our volume, centimeters, I think that's cubed technically. If our radius is 5, 
The circumference is 31.42, the area is 78.54, and the volume is 523.60 centimeters cubed. All right, everybody, well, I thought that would be some good practice with some math functions. Now we're a little more comfortable using them. If you would like a copy of this code, I'll post it in the comments section down below. And well, those are some useful math-related functions in PHP. Hey, welcome back everybody. In today's video, I'm going to discuss if statements in PHP. With an if statement, we have a condition. If some condition is true, we can do something. We can run some code. However, if that condition is false, then we don't do it. Here's a situation. Suppose we have a website, but you have to be 18 years or older to enter. We can write a program to check somebody's age. Let's say we have a variable age. Age will equal, make up a number, 21. To write an if statement, I would type if, then I'll need a condition within parentheses. What are we checking? Let's check to see if our variable age is greater than or equal to 18. Then after the set of parentheses, add a set of curly braces. If this condition is true, we can execute some code. If it's false, we skip over this code. So if our age is greater than or equal to 18, Let's echo, you may enter this site. So I'm going to save, run this program. You may enter this site. What if this condition was false? Maybe my age is 15. In our if statement, this condition is false. That means we do not execute this code. We skip over it, as if it never even happened. If you would rather do some other code, at the end of your if statement, you can add else, then add a set of curly braces. If this condition is false, then skip over this code and execute the else statement. Instead, let's echo, you must be 18 plus to enter. Let's save. And here's our other message. You must be 18 plus to enter. If I were to change age to 21, something that's above or equal to 18, well, we execute the first statement, this portion of our if statement. You may enter the site. If this is true, do this. If not, do this instead. Between if and else, you can add else if. Else if, add a set of parentheses and a set of curly braces. If our condition is false, we would then check any else if statements before resorting to the else statement. Let's also check if age is equal to zero. Double equals is the comparison operator. You can check to see if two values are equal. You don't want to use a single equal sign because that is the assignment operator. PHP thinks you're assigning age to be zero. Use double equals for comparison. If somebody's age is zero, then let's echo a different message. You were just born. I will set variable age to be zero. Save. You were just born. This condition was false. We skip it. This condition was true, so we execute it. We never reach the else statement. However, somebody types in negative one. Well, then we resort to the else statement because both of these conditions are false. Let's change our else if statement. Let's say else if age is less than or equal to zero. Let's change this message. That wasn't a valid age. Negative one is not a valid age. Just to be funny, what if we said you are too old, too old to enter this site? I'll add another else if statement just to demonstrate that we can add multiple else if statements. Else if age is greater than or equal to 100. Then we will echo. You are too old to enter this site. If I were to set age to be 101, the result states that you may enter this site. The reason that we're executing this if statement and not this else if statement is because 
starting from the top, we check the if statement first. If it's false, we continue down the line until we reach else. Age is 101. Since this statement is technically true, we would execute this code, then skip everything else. The order of your if and else if statements does matter. I'm going to move this section of code to the beginning and make it the if statement. First, let's check to see if somebody's age is greater than or equal to 100. I will change this section to be else if. And that should work. You are too old to enter this site. You do need to pay attention to the order of your conditions. I'll give you another example. If statements also work with Boolean variables and values. We have a variable adult. Adult will equal a Boolean value of either true or false. Let's set that to be true. With your condition, you can check to see if your variable is equal, use double equals for comparison, true or false. If adult is equal to true, then we will echo, you may enter this site. Adult is true. You may enter the site. If adult is false, then nothing happens. So let's add else, echo, you must be an adult to enter. You must be an adult to enter. Now there is a shorthand if you're using the comparison operator followed by a Boolean value. You could just write the Boolean variable itself. That is also valid, and that's my preferred way of using Boolean variables within a condition. If adult, do something. So let's set adult to be true. You may enter this site. If it's false, you must be an adult to enter. So that is the second example. Let's go over an exercise. We will create a program to calculate somebody's pay, including overtime. We will need three variables. Hours, I'll set that to be 40 to begin with. They're working full time. A rate, as in a rate of pay. This person is making $15 per hour. And then a weekly pay. I will set that to be null to begin with. Depending on somebody's hours, they may or may not make overtime pay. Or if they work zero hours, they don't receive any pay this week. First, let's calculate their weekly pay if they work 40 hours or less. If hours is less than or equal to 40, then we will calculate our weekly pay with this formula. It's only hours times their rate, rate of pay. Then at the end, let's echo you made at our placeholder this week. Within our placeholder, let's display the weekly pay variable. Pick your unit of currency. I'll use American dollars. I'll need to add an escape sequence. 40 times 15, I think that's 600. You made $600 this week. If we worked 20 hours, then we make half of that $300. What if somebody doesn't work this week? You made $0 this week. What if somebody enters in a negative amount of hours, like negative 1? Well, somebody made negative money this week. Let's write a condition to prevent that. Let's add an if statement. Then change this statement to be an else if statement. If somebody's hours are less than or equal to 0, then let's set weekly pay to be zero. Just in case somebody enters in a negative amount of hours, because you can't work a negative amount. Even if somebody enters in a negative number, like negative one or negative 10, our message still displays zero, which is what we want. Lastly, let's calculate overtime pay. We'll do this within an else statement. Here's the formula. Let's set weekly pay equal to the first 40 hours are going to be at the standard rate. Let's take our rate times 40. 
then we will add within a set of parentheses we need to calculate the overtime pay maybe an employee works 50 hours this week let's take hours minus 40 I'm gonna add another set of parentheses around this multiplied by rate times 1.5 because with overtime pay at least in the United States I believe you make one and a half times your pay your hourly rate of pay if an employee works 50 hours this week their new weekly pay will be $825 that is an exercise involving if statements and those are if statements in PHP Hello friends, it's me again, and in today's topic I'm going to explain logical operators in PHP. There's three, AND, OR, NOT. They're used to combine conditional statements. For example, if we have an IF statement, we check a condition. Using these logical operators, we can check more than one condition if using AND. If that were OR, we can check if at least one condition is true. With the case with NOT, we can reverse a condition. If it's true, it's now false. If it's false, it's now true. More on that later. We can make our conditional statements a little more sophisticated with logical operators. Here's an example. We have a temperature. We would like to check to see if our temperature falls within a certain range. Let's say we have variable temp short for temperature. This will be in Celsius because most of my viewers are from outside of the United States. In the United States, we use Fahrenheit, but use whatever works for you. Let's say the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius. Let's write an if statement to check to see if our temperature falls within a certain range. If temp is greater than or equal to zero, we'll start with one condition. Then let's echo the weather is good. Our temp is 25, 25 degrees Celsius. The weather is good. What if my temperature was 100 degrees Celsius? Well, the weather is obviously not good, right? In fact, the weather is horrible. To make sure our temperature isn't above a certain number, we can use the AND logical operator, which is a double ampersand. If our temperature is equal to or above zero, AND, our temperature is less than or equal to 30, 30 degrees Celsius, then the weather is good. This statement is true, but this one is false. With the AND logical operator, both conditions must be true in order for us to execute this statement. Otherwise, let's add an else clause. Else, echo, the weather is bad so 100 degrees celsius that is not a good temperature the weather is bad what about negative 10 negative 10 degrees celsius well the weather is still bad 15 the weather is good 15 falls within our range 15 is greater than or equal to zero and 15 is less than or equal to 30. Now, using the OR logical operator, which is two vertical bars, at least one of these conditions needs to be true. If we're writing the same program using the OR logical operator, this is what I would change. Let's say if temp is less than zero or temp is greater than 30, then the weather is bad, else the weather is good. Let's change temp to negative 1 million. Well, the weather is bad. If our temperature was positive 1 million, I believe that's actually 100 million. Uh, well, the weather is obviously bad as well. If our temperature is 25, then the weather is good. With our temperature being this high, this statement is false, but this one is true. Using the OR logical operator, only one of these conditions needs to be true. That's another way in which you can write conditions. You could use the OR logical operator. Use whatever is best for your situation. 
Okay, let's set temp to something reasonable like 15. All right, now I'm going to discuss the not logical operator. Let's add a variable cloudy. This will be a Boolean variable. It's either true or false. Let's set that to be true. The temperature is 15 degrees Celsius and the sky is cloudy. That's set to true. Using an if statement, if we're checking a Boolean variable, we could write cloudy is equal to true. But if we're working with Booleans, we can just shorten this to if the Boolean variable name. That's valid. If it's cloudy, let's echo. It's cloudy. Else, echo, it's sunny. Um, let me add one line break. Line break, line break, and I think we're good. The weather is good, it's cloudy. Using the not logical operator, we can precede our condition with an exclamation point. If this condition is true, the not logical operator will reverse it essentially. So if not cloudy, that means it's sunny, else it's cloudy. So it's cloudy, I will change cloudy to be false, it's now sunny. That's basically the not logical operator. It will reverse the state of your condition, meaning you can check to see if something is not true. Let's go over some practice. In this example, let's say that your country has elections. Let's assume that it's a democratic nation. In many countries, you have to be 18 years or older to vote, right? I'm assuming. Maybe we have variable age. Set this equal to whatever your age is. Let's say that I'm 25 this time. And we have a Boolean variable named citizen. And I will set that to be true. We're going to use the AND logical operator to see if we can vote. So with an if statement, if variable age is greater than or equal to 18, I'm in the United States. In order to vote, you have to be at least 18 years old. If we're at least 18 years old and we're a US citizen, citizen, then let's echo, you can vote. In my example, I'm 25, I'm a citizen, both these conditions are true, that means I can vote. Else, if one of these statements wasn't true, then let's echo, you cannot vote. Let's say that I am 12, 12 years old. Well, I cannot vote, I'm too young. Or if I was not a citizen, citizen is false, well, I cannot vote either. Another way in which you could write this program is you could say, this is a little more complex, by the way. If age is not greater than or equal to 18, or you are not a citizen, then you cannot vote, else you can vote. I'm 18, but I'm not a citizen. I cannot vote. I'm 18 but I am a citizen, you can vote. I would probably stick with the previous example just because it's easier to read, but this is another way in which we can use the not logical operator and the or logical operator. Let's go over a last example, just so that we really get the hang of this. We're going to sell movie tickets. We will have some Boolean variables. We'll have a child variable. I will set that to be false to begin with. A senior. I will set that to be false, then a ticket price, which I will set to be null to begin with. If somebody's a child or a senior, they get a discount. If child or senior, then the ticket price will be uh, maybe $10. Else, ticket equals $15. That's quite a steep discount. Then at the end of our program, let's echo, 
The ticket price is, I'll add a placeholder, add variable ticket, pick a unit of currency, I'll pick American dollars. Child is set to false. We're not a child, that's set to false. We're not a senior, that's set to false. The ticket price is $15, the standard. This is false, or this is false. That means we don't execute the statement. We move on to the else statement. If we were a child, let's set that to be true, then we get that discount. The ticket price is $10. If we set child to be false, but we're a senior, I'll set that to be true, we still get that discount. All right, everybody, point being with logical operators, there's many different ways in which we can check conditions. There's and or not. Use whatever is best for your situation. Typically, there's more than one way in which you can check a condition. Well, everybody, those are logical operators in PHP. Hey, what's going on, everybody? So in today's video, I need to explain switch statements. A switch is a replacement to using many else if statements. Switches are more efficient and take less code to write compared to using many else if statements. Here is an example. I have a letter grade. A student's grade can be A, B, C, D, F. Or if their grade is invalid, we have an else statement that states that letter grade is not valid. Depending on what our grade is, we will execute one of many statements. If our grade is A, then we will echo, you did great. If it's B, you did good. C, you did okay. D, you did poorly. F, you failed. If we have a grade that isn't valid, such as pizza, well, that's not a grade. Pizza is not a valid grade. Using many else if statements is fairly inefficient, and it's a lot to write too. I would like to propose a better solution, and that is by using a switch, which is the topic of this video. To create a switch, we will type switch, add a set of parentheses, then add a set of curly braces. Within the parentheses of the switch, what would we like to examine? Let's examine our letter grade. Then we'll probably want to change our letter grade to something valid, like A. Within the switch, we're going to create cases. One case for each match that we're looking up. Type case. What are we comparing our grade to? Let's compare our grade to the letter A. Then add a colon. If our grade matches this case, we'll write some code. What do we want to do? Let's echo, you did great. After all of your code, add break to break out of the switch. This is the first case. Let's copy this case. Underneath it, after the break statement, let's paste it. Then we will have case B. You did good. Let's copy this again. Case C, you did okay. Then D, you did poorly. Case F, you failed. Our grade is currently an A. You did great. Let's test out case B. You did good. C, you did okay. D, you did poorly. F, you failed. What if we have a grade that isn't valid, like pizza again? Well, nothing happens. There were no matching cases. We simply exit the switch. If none of these cases match, you can add a default case. Type default. I can't spell it right today. If there are no matching cases, what are we going to do? Let's echo some sort of message. I'll add a placeholder. Our grade variable is not valid. So pizza is obviously not a letter grade. Pizza is not valid. There were no matching cases. Therefore, we resulted to the default case. The default case is kind of like the else statement. 
Now, the reason that you have break in here, let me demonstrate, is because you will break out of the switch. What if we were missing these break statements? Temporarily, I'm going to remove them. Let's say that our grade is B. You did good, you did okay, you did poorly, you failed, B is not valid. You need the break statement to break out of the switch. Wherever there's a match, we will execute the code followed underneath, then any subsequent code followed after. So be sure to include those break statements. Unless you want to execute every statement afterwards. In some cases that could be helpful, but not for this one. Let's go over another example. We're going to get the current date. I'll create variable date. To get the current date, we will use the date function. Within the parentheses of the date function, within a set of quotes, type L. Just to be sure it's working fine, let's echo our date for testing. L will give you the day of the week. Currently, for me, it's Monday. So let's place our date within a switch. We'll create a switch, parentheses, curly braces. We are examining our date. Then we'll need a case, case, Monday. If today is Monday, let's echo, I hate Mondays. Then break. So it's Monday, I will echo, I hate Mondays. So let's copy this case, paste it, change Monday to Tuesday. What can we say for Tuesday? It is Taco Tuesday. So currently for me, it's still Monday. Just for testing purposes, I am going to change our date after we get the current date. I just want to be sure that our switch is working. What if our date was Tuesday? It is Taco Tuesday. What if it's Wednesday? The work week is half over. Let's change our case to be Wednesday. The work week is half over. Thursday. It's almost the weekend. Let's change our date to be Thursday. It's almost the weekend. Friday. The weekend is here. The weekend is here. Saturday. Time to party. Time to party. Then Sunday. Time to... Let's relax on Sunday. Time to relax. It's optional, but we could add a default case if there are no matching cases. Let's echo. Our variable date is not a day. Let's change our date to something like pizza. Well, pizza is not a day. So I'll remove this line. Depending on what day you're executing this code, it will display a custom message depending on the day of the week. Like I said, today for me, it's Monday. So my message prints, I hate Mondays. All right, everybody, in conclusion, a switch is a replacement to using many else if statements. They're more efficient and take less code to write. I would recommend a switch if you're checking some value or variable many times over. And well, everybody, those are switches in PHP. 
Hey everybody, in today's video I need to explain for loops. A for loop will repeat some code a certain amount of times. For example, I will display the word hello. Hello, then I will add a line break. I can write code once, then repeat it however many times that I want with the for loop. To create a for loop, type for, parentheses curly braces, then place your code you want to be repeated within the set of curly braces. I would like to display the word hello a certain amount of times. That's the nice thing about for loops. You can write code once, then repeat it. But we'll need to calculate how many times we're going to repeat it. Within the parentheses of the for loop, we can write up to three optional statements, each separated with a semicolon. The first statement is that we can create a counter. It's as if we're assigning a variable. A common naming convention for a counter is variable i, i meaning index. I can set this equal to zero to begin with. The next statement is a stopping condition. When this condition is no longer true, we escape the for loop. I would like to display the word hello five times. My condition will be variable i is less than five. Once i is no longer less than five, we will escape. The third optional statement we can use to increment or decrement our counter. After each iteration, I will increment i by one, i plus plus. This code will be repeated five times. Here we are, one, two, three, four, five. Instead of displaying the word hello, let's display our index i, then add a line break. i currently holds our counter. We set the counter to begin at zero, and it will stop when i reaches five. Zero, one, two, three, four. Maybe we would like to start at one and continue as long as i is less than or equal to five. Then we're no longer beginning at zero. We could change this condition to be 10. We will count up to 10. Or 100. We will count up to 100. When you increment your variable, you can increment by a different number, like 2. i plus equals 2. We are now counting up by 2s. 1, 3, 5, 7. If we change our counter to be 2, we'll start at 2, then count up by 2. Or maybe we can count up by 3s. 2, 5, 8, 11. Now to decrement, let's begin at 10. Our counter will be at 10. We'll continue this for loop as long as i is greater than 0. Then to decrement, take i, then add minus minus. So now we begin at 10 and decrement by 1 during each iteration. Or we can even decrement by 2's. i minus equals 2. So we begin at 10 and we're decrementing by 2's. So that's a for loop. You repeat some code a certain amount of times. There are three optional statements within the for loop. A counter we can declare, a condition, then we can increment our counter by a certain amount, or decrement. Let's go over an exercise. We will create an HTML form. In VS Code, hit exclamation point, tab, that will generate some HTML code. We'll create a form. The opening form tag will have an action attribute of our PHP page, index.php. The method, let's assign to post. We'll create a label. Label, close it. Enter a number to count to. We will add a text box, input, type, the type is text, the name will be counter, then a submit button, input type equals submit, for the value, let's say start. The user is going to type in a number to count up to. We'll need to get that value from the text box. Let's say variable counter. We will access the post super global variable. We would like our counter. 
Then we'll create a for loop. For parentheses curly braces. We'll need our index for our for loop. So variable i equals zero to begin with. We're counting up. Our condition will be variable i is less than or equal to our counter. Then we will increment variable i by one during each iteration. During each iteration, let's echo whatever variable i is, then add a line break. Let's see what happens. Let's refresh this. Let's count up to 10. I'll enter 10, press start, then we count up to 10. If you would like to exclude zero, we can set i to be one. There we are, we have counted up to 10. Or I could pick a different number like 100. Press start, we now count up to 100. Now what we're gonna do is count down from a number. Enter a number to count down from. We're gonna change our for loop a little bit. We will set our counter of i to equal the number that we receive, our counter variable. We'll continue as long as i is greater than zero, then we will decrement i. So let's save. You might have to refresh. Let's count down from 10. Press start, and here we are. We have started at 10, and we have counted down to one. Or I can enter a different number like 100. So we start at 100, then count down to one. So that's a for loop, everybody. You can repeat some code a certain amount of times. You only have to write it once, then repeat it however many times that you need. And well, everybody, those are for loops in PHP. Hey everybody, it's me again. Today I'm gonna explain while loops in PHP. With the while loop, you can do some code infinitely while some condition remains true. It's very similar to a for loop, but with the for loop, we intend to do some code a limited amount of times. With the while loop, it may be infinite. There's a lot of overlap where you can use either a for loop or a while loop. Here's how to create one. Type while, parentheses, curly braces. Within the parentheses, we can set a condition. Let's say we have a counter variable. We will count up to 10. Keep doing this code while counter is less than or equal to 10. Another difference between a for loop and a while loop is that with the while loop, we don't have three statements. We just have one. With the for loop, you can create an index, a condition, and there's another statement to increment or decrement. We don't have that with the while loop, so we'll have to set that manually. Outside of the while loop, let's say we have a counter. Counter will equal zero. While counter is less than or equal to 10, let's increment our counter by one. Counter plus plus. Then let's echo our counter variable. Then add a break. So simple enough. That should be less than 10. There. We escape the while loop when this condition is no longer true. It's very similar to a for loop. Honestly, in this situation, I would probably stick with the for loop because you're still doing something a limited amount of times. While loops tend to be better if you need to do something possibly infinitely. Let's say we have um, a stopwatch program. We don't know when the user is going to stop the stopwatch. We would need to keep on updating our stopwatch until the user presses stop. So we could write a program like this instead. Suppose we have a variable seconds to keep track of the amount of seconds then a boolean variable named running. If our stopwatch is no longer running, if somebody hits the stop button, we will set that to be false. Our condition could be while running is equal to true. If this variable is a boolean, we can just shorten this to while running, while our stopwatch is running, update the time or something. I haven't talked about the sleep function yet, but we can make our program sleep for a given amount of seconds. So let's pretend that we wait one second. Then after waiting one second, let's increment seconds by one, then echo the current amount of seconds. And I will add a break. I wouldn't recommend running this code. We're going to be stuck in what is known as an infinite loop. Our program has no way of stopping and it might crash your computer. You can see that the time just goes on and on forever. So let's stop that. My computer might crash. 
This code is going to run forever because we have no way of escaping this loop. If you have a while loop, you'll want some way to break out of the while loop from inside of it. I'm going to create a stop button. I now have a stop button. Let's stop that before it crashes. Now to escape out of this loop, I could write some code like this. I'm going to write an if statement. I haven't discussed the is set function yet, but we can check to see if a button is clicked or not. I'm going to access our post variable. And I have created a stop button with the name of stop. If I click the stop button, then let's set running to be false. Then we can escape out of the while loop. Else, if the user doesn't press the stop button, then let's wait another second and update our timer. So this program is going to continue until I hit the stop button. And it broke. There, it stopped. What you should remember from this is that a while loop will do some code, possibly forever, while some condition is true. You would need some way of making your condition false. In this case, I just set up a button to stop the timer. There is a lot of overlap where you can use either a for loop or a while loop. If you need to do something a limited amount of times, use a for loop. If you need to do something a possibly infinite amount of times, a while loop might be better. And well, everybody, those are while loops in PHP. Why, hello again everybody. Today I need to explain arrays in PHP. Think of an array as a special type of variable which can hold more than one value at a time. In my example, I have four different variables. Food 1, food 2, food 3, food 4. We have an apple, orange, banana, coconut. It can be very inconvenient to have to work with so many variables. It would be really nice if I could store all of these values in one place, which is what we can do with an array. Let's delete these variables. We will create a special type of variable, which is an array. To create an array, you'll need a variable name to begin with. Let's say foods. Foods equals, to create an array, type array, add a set of parentheses, then the semicolon at the end. This is a function, which we'll discuss more in the future. Whatever values you're going to squeeze into this variable, just place them within the parentheses. We had four variables, apple, orange, banana, coconut. Separate all of your values with a comma. There we go. We now have what appears to be a variable, but it's technically an array. It stores more than one value in one convenient place. If I was to echo my array, which I named foods, this is what happens. Warning, array to string conversion. We can't directly print this array. Instead, you would need to access one of the elements. An element is a given position within an array. Currently, we have four elements because there's four values. To access one of the elements found within your array, after the array name, add a set of square brackets then an element number. With arrays, the first element has an index of zero. I would like the first element within my array, so the element is going to be zero. That will display apple, which is the first element in my array. Let's do this with the others for practice. Let's echo foods at index one. I should probably add a line break, so let me do some string concatenation real quick. I'll add a line break. Do that here as well. We have apple, orange. Let's do this with the others. Foods at index two is banana. Foods at index three, that would be coconut. What if I attempt to access an element that doesn't exist? We only have four elements. If I access our array foods at index four, well then, we have a warning, undefined array, key 4. That is something you do need to pay attention to. 
If you need to display all of the elements of an array, there's an easier way of doing this instead of echoing every single element line by line. We can use a for each loop. For each. Add a set of parentheses, then a set of curly braces. For each, take your array, foods, as. Now what we need is a temporary name for each element within the array. My personal naming convention, if I'm accessing a single element within an array, I like to take the array name and set the variable name to be the singular version. If we're working with foods, well, each element is considered a food. For every food in foods, if we were working with different values, let's say cars, my for each loop may be for every car in cars. But that's just my naming convention. So within this for each loop, I will echo each food. Then I'll add a break line. Okay, let's see what happens. Here are all the elements in our array. To display all of the elements in your array, a convenient way to do so is to use a for each loop. There are a lot of useful utilities related to arrays. To change one of the elements of an array, type the name of the array, then we'll list an index number. I would like to change the first element in this array to be a pineapple. Type the name of the array, followed by a set of square brackets. The first element in my array is zero. I will set that to equal a new value. Foods at index zero is now a pineapple. Pineapple, orange, banana, coconut. There is a push function which will add a new element to the end of your array. Array underscore push function. Within the set of parentheses, type in the name of your array, comma, then a value. At the end of my array, I would like to add a pineapple. Apple, orange, banana, coconut, pineapple. You can add more than one value too. Let's add a kiwi as well. Apple, orange, banana, coconut, pineapple, kiwi. That is the array push function. You can add one or more elements to the end of your array after you create one. Then we have the pop function, array underscore pop. Pop will remove the last element in your array. Place your array name within the set of parentheses. Array pop foods. Now we have apple, orange, banana. Our last element, coconut, was removed. Then we have shift, array underscore shift. Shift will remove the first element in your array. Then shift all of the elements over by one. Within the set of parentheses, list your array name. We now have an orange, banana, coconut. Our apple was removed. It was shifted, shifted out of the array. We can reverse an array. Array underscore reverse. Place your array name within the set of parentheses. Now this isn't gonna work. I'll explain why. Our array is still in the same order. Apple, orange, banana, coconut. This function returns a new array. We can assign the result to a new array such as reversed foods equals the array reverse function. Then I could display this. Our array is now reversed. Coconut, banana, orange, apple. Otherwise, the array that's returned, we can reassign it to the same array, which is what I'll do. That does the same thing, if you would rather reuse the same array. That is how to reverse an array. We can count the elements in an array. I will echo, use the count function, place your array name within the function. Let me cut this real quick. We have four elements within our array. Use the count function to get the current number of elements within your array. All right, everybody, so that's an array. Think of it as a special type of variable that can hold more than one value at a time. It's a convenient way to store multiple values that are similar or related in place of creating many different variables. It's a lot easier to work with an array than several variables. 
And well, everybody, those are arrays in PHP. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Today, I'm going to explain associative arrays. It's an array where each element is a key value pair. For example, we can make an array where each element is a country, that's the key, and the value is a capital. A few other examples could be an ID and a username, or an item and a price. These would be examples of key value pairs. Here's an example. Let's start with a basic array. I will create an array of capitals. Capitals equals, we will use the array function. We'll begin with keys. Each key needs to be unique. I'll think of four examples. We have the USA, Japan, South Korea, then maybe India. Right now, capitals is an array. It's not an associative array. To change this array into an associative array, after each key, add an arrow. For readability, I'm going to place each element on a new line. It's not necessary, but it's a lot easier for me to read. Following the arrow, we will give each key a value. The value in this example will be each country's respective capital. The capital of the USA is Washington, D.C. Japan, that's Kyoto. South Korea, that is Seoul. India, New Delhi. We now have an associative array. It's made of key value pairs. If you need one of the values at a given key, we would then access our associative array, capitals, at index, then place your key within the set of square brackets. Let's find the capital of the USA. Then let's echo whatever the result is. And the result is Washington, DC. If I change the key to Japan, we will be given the value at this key of Japan. To print all of the key value pairs of our associative array, we'll use a for each loop. Within the parentheses, we're going to write something a little different. First, we need our associative array. Capitals as key arrow value. This for each loop will loop through all of the key value pairs. Let's print them. Echo. I'll add a placeholder. Let's print each key and each value. Then I'll add a break line. Here are the keys. And here are the values. I'll add an equal sign before key and value, just so it's more readable. That's how to use a for each loop to loop through all the key value pairs in this associative array. To change one of the values, we need to access this array by a key. I'll change the capital of the USA to be maybe Las Vegas. Let's take our associative array. Then I would like to access, using square brackets, USA. Set this equal to some new value. The new value will be Las Vegas. When I run this program, the value at this key is now Las Vegas. That's how to update a key value pair. First, look up the key, then you can set the value equal to some new value. To add a new key value pair, we will access our associative array, add a set of square brackets, then place a new key within a set of quotes within the square brackets. Let's add China. China will equal Beijing. There's our new key value pair. The key is China. The value is Beijing. The pop function will remove the last pair in this array. Array underscore pop. We will pop our associative array capitals. Our pairing of India and New Delhi is gone. That's how to remove the last pair in this array. 
the shift function will remove the first element. Array, shift, pass in your array. The USA and Washington DC pair is now gone. It's shifted out of the array. If you ever need all of the keys in this associative array, there is an array keys function. Array, keys, pass in your array of capitals. This will return a new array. I will assign that to a new array. Let's name it keys. Then I'm going to display all of the keys within our array using the for each loop. So let's change this a little bit. We have an array of keys and I would like to display as key. For every key in keys, let's echo each key. Then I'll add a line break. Here are all of the keys within our associative array. If you need the values instead, there's a values function. Array, values. I'll create a new array named values. For every value in values, print each value. And here are the capitals, all of the values within our associative array. You can flip the keys and the values by using the flip function. Array, flip, pass in your array within the set of parentheses. This function will return a new associative array. We can either create a new associative array or reassign it. I'll reassign our associative array. Then we need to change our for each loop again. So we have capitals as key arrow value. Then we will display every key and every value. Key equals value. Our values are now switched with our keys. The capitals are now the keys. The countries are the values. That is the array flip function. If you need to reverse the order of your pairs, you can use the reverse function. Array underscore reverse. Pass in your array. This will return a new array. I will reassign it. The order in which we originally placed these key value pairs is now reversed. India is now at the beginning. The USA is now at the end. Then if you need the amount of key value pairs, you can use the count function. Echo count capitals. Let me get rid of this for each loop to demonstrate. We have four pairs within our associative array. One, two, three, four. All right, everybody, so it's time for some practice. I will delete everything but our associative array. We'll create an HTML document. So preceding our PHP script, Using VS Code, I will type an exclamation point, then hit tab to create some sample HTML. We'll create a text box. A user is going to type in a country, hit submit, then we will return the value for that associated country, that capital. We'll need a form. Form, be sure to close it right away. The action will equal index.php, the method, will be post. Let's create a label. Enter a country. Then we'll need a text box. Input type equals text. The name will be country. Then a button. Input type equals submit. Here we are. Within our PHP script, we have our associative array. We'll need to access whatever's within this text box. I'll store that within a new variable named capital singular. Capital equals dollar sign underscore post. The value we are trying to access is the name country. Let's see what we have so far. 
just for testing, I'm going to echo our capital. If I type in USA, then click Submit, this should return USA. To get the value associated with this key, USA, I will take our associative array, capitals, at index of a country. So in this example, it's USA, right? I can copy this post variable, delete this line. Within the set of quotes, I will place the post variable, then get rid of the quotes. I will reassign capital to equal whatever value we receive. So I will type in this time Japan, then this returns Kyoto. We could even put this variable within a sentence. The capital is our capital variable. If we type India, then click Submit, the capital is New Delhi. All right, everybody, so that's an associative array. It's an array made of key value pairs. You could create an associative array of countries and capitals, ID numbers and usernames, or items and a price. Those are a few examples. And well, everybody, those are associative arrays in PHP. Hello again, everybody. Today, I need to explain two useful PHP functions. The first is the isSet function. The other is the empty function. These are two useful functions to determine if HTML elements are filled in or otherwise interacted with. The isSet function returns true if a variable is declared and not null. Empty returns true if a variable is not declared, false, null, or is an empty string. Here's an example. Let's create a username variable. Username equals make up some username. I am going to echo, then use the isSet function, place some value or variable within the parentheses of this function. When I run this program, we output 1. In PHP, 1 means true. If username was null, isSet returns false. We don't display anything. Let's go over a few different values using an if statement. If is set at a set of parentheses, if the is set function returns true, let's echo this variable is set. Else, let's echo this variable is not set. Under which circumstances does the isSet function return true? That function returns true if a variable is declared and not null. What if we don't have a variable? The isSet function returns false. That means we execute this else statement. This variable is not set. What if we declare a variable and it's null? Well, the variable is not set either. What if this value was true? This variable is set. How about false? The variable is set. An empty string. The variable is set. Type in a username. The variable is also set. Those are the circumstances in which the isSet function will return either true or false. Now let's use the empty function. This function will return true if a variable is not declared false, null, or an empty string. Let's change is set to the empty function. We will examine our username variable. If this variable is empty, let's echo this variable is empty. Else, this variable is not empty. If we don't have a variable, I'll get rid of our username. This variable is empty. If username is null, the variable is empty still. True, the variable is not empty. False, the variable is empty. An empty string, the variable is still empty. Type in a username, the variable is not empty. 
Now what we're going to do is create an HTML login form. We'll need a username, a password, and a login button. We can use a combination of the isSet and empty functions to determine if our login button is interacted with or our username and password fields are filled in. So let's create an HTML document. Within the body of my document, I will create a form, then close it right away. In the opening form tag, we will set the action attribute to equal our PHP document. The method, let's use post. We will need two labels, one for username, the other for password. Username. Let's copy this label, paste it, change username to password. I'll add a text box. The name attribute will be set to username. I'll add a break line, copy this text box, paste it underneath password, change text to password. Let's set the name attribute to be password. Then we need a submit button. Input type equals submit. Let's set the name equal to be, let's set the name attribute to be a login. Then I will set the value, the text on the button to be log in. Here's our sample login form. Using the post super global variable is technically an associative array, which we learned about in the last topic. For demonstration purposes, I'm going to use a for each loop and iterate over all of the elements within this array. Let's access our post super global variable, iterate over post as key arrow value. Then during each iteration, every key, every value, then add a break line. I should probably add a break line after the submit button too. You may need to reload your page. Then if I press login, we will spit out the associative array that's contained within our post super global variable. Here are the keys and here are the values. Our username and password are both empty strings. This thing, our login key has this value, whatever value we set within the HTML element. If we hit the login button, we can check to see if this key using the is set function, we can determine if this value is set. Using the empty function, we can determine if these values are empty, which they currently are. We can yell at the user, like, hey, what the heck, you didn't enter in your username or password. I will reuse this for each loop later. Let me just turn this into one giant comment. Now that we know how that works, let's check to see if our button is clicked. Let's write an if statement. If is set function access the post super global variable, we are looking for our login button whatever the name is set to. For testing purposes, let's echo, you tried to log in. So if I save, I need to reload the page. If I press the login button, this button is now set. You tried to log in. We no longer need this line for testing. Let's save. After pressing the login button, Let's check if our username is filled in. Let's get the username. Username equals we are accessing the post super global variable. The key is our username, whatever the name is. Then let's get our password too while we're at it. Variable password equals the key is password. Within our if statement, we will write an inner if statement. If empty function, if our username is empty, then let's echo username is missing. Else we will display a welcome message. Echo. Hello. 
variable username. Okay, let's reload. I'm gonna press login without filling in a username. Username is missing. But if I type in a username, then log in, we get our hello message. Hello, bro code. I'll add an else if statement. Then we'll check to see if our password is missing. If empty function, we are examining our password. Then we will echo password is missing. Let's save, reload, type in a username. Don't type in a password. Press login. Password is missing. In order to output this hello message, we need both a username and a password. Type in a username, type in a password, pizza123, press login, and you get your welcome message. I'm going to enclose the section of code within a comment block. Let's go back to our for each loop. There's something I want to explain. So let's save, reload, make up a username, type in a password. When I press login, you can see that our username and password fields are both filled in. They're no longer empty. This is our associative array contained within the post super global variable. Using these if statements, the first thing we were checking is if our login button is set, which it is, it contains a value. Then we were checking if our username and passwords were empty or not. This time they were not empty. That's what it looks like behind the scenes when you're accessing the post super global variable. It's made of key value pairs, and you can determine if a value is set or it's empty. All right, everybody, so that is the is set and empty functions in PHP. Hey, everybody, in today's topic, I'm going to show you how we can work with radio buttons in PHP. Let's get started. To begin, we'll need an HTML form. I'm pretty sure you know how to create that already. Within our HTML form, the action attribute will be set to our PHP file. The method will be post. To create a single radio button, we can use a self-closing input tag. Set the type equal to be radio. Let's select a credit card. I will set the first radio button to have a value of Visa. Here's our little radio button. I'll add some text afterwards. Let's say Visa. Then I will add a line break. Okay, let's copy these two lines of markup, paste these twice, then change the second radio button to be MasterCard, then the third will be American Express. So let's change these values. Here are three radio buttons, but we have a problem. We can select more than one radio button. If we would like these within the same group, we only ever should be able to select one at a time. We need a name attribute. Name equals, let's say credit card. Be sure to set this attribute for all of the three radio buttons. They all need the same name. There, we can only select one now. If these had a different name, such as credit card one, credit card two, credit card three, well, they're technically all in different groups. We need them all in the same group to select only one. Then lastly, let's add a submit button. Input type equals submit. The name may be confirm. It's a confirm button. We're confirming some payment type. For the value, I will set that to be confirm as well. Now, when I click on this button, I would like to output a message depending on which radio button is selected. Let's test to see that everything's working fine, though. I will create a local variable named credit card. I will set credit card equal to. Now, to get one of these values, we need to use the post variable, whatever we set for the method. Access post. The key we are looking for is credit card, whatever the name attribute is set to, the name of the group. Now, when I run and reload this, we have an undefined array key credit card, which is to be expected. We're running our PHP script, but we have not yet set the credit card key. Let's enclose our code with an if statement. We'll check to see if our confirm button is pressed. 
is it set? If it is, then assign our variable. If parentheses curly braces, we will use the is set function, which we learned about in the last topic. We would like to check to see if our confirm button is set. Let's access post. The key we are looking for is confirm, whatever the name is. If we press the button, then assign our variable of credit card. Then let's echo our credit card for testing purposes. Echo credit card. Let's see what happens. I'm going to press the confirm button. Then we get that warning, which is a step in the right direction. If I make a selection, then press confirm. We will echo whatever value is stored within our credit card variable. It's going to be one of these three values, either Visa, MasterCard, or American Express. Before assigning the variable, I would like this warning to not display after pressing the confirm button. Instead, let's display a message. Please select a credit card or something. Let's create a nested if statement. We will use the isSet function again. This time, let's check to see if our credit card is set. If our credit card is set, then get the value and store it within a variable. Then for testing, let's echo that credit card. If our credit card is not set, we can execute an else statement. Else, let's echo. Please make a selection. If I don't make a selection, then press confirm. We will echo this message, please make a selection. In order to continue, we need to make a selection. Let's select Visa. We will output Visa, MasterCard, then American Express. Currently, we have a variable credit card that has one of these three values. One thing you could do with this variable is check to see if it's equal to a certain value. I'm going to change my program around a little bit. If we press the confirm button and one of these radio buttons is selected, then assign our variable. Let's get rid of this echo. I'll add some if and else if statements. This is just for demonstration purposes. If our credit card is equal to Visa, then let's echo. You selected Visa. Let's add an else if statement. Else if credit card is equal to MasterCard, you selected MasterCard. Else if credit card is equal to American Express, you selected American Express. Then else, else if credit card doesn't equal one of these three matches, then let's echo, please make a selection. All right, let's see what happens currently. If I make a selection, such as Visa, we will echo, you selected Visa, you selected MasterCard, you selected American Express. But currently, if I press the confirm button without making a selection, we have some warnings that our credit card variable is undefined, but we still execute the else clause, as you can see here. One change I'll make is that let's declare our variable credit card, but we won't assign it a value. Credit card equals null. Then we won't receive that warning that credit card is undefined. We have declared it. I'll press confirm. Please make a selection. I can select one of these credit cards and we will display a message. In this circumstance, I would probably use a switch. We're comparing some value against many matching cases. I think a switch would be more efficient. So let's create a switch for practice. Within our switch, we are examining our credit card. We will examine our credit card against matching cases. Visa. If our credit card is equal to Visa, then let's echo. 
You selected Visa. Then add a break statement to break out of the switch. Let's do this for MasterCard. Add a case for MasterCard. MasterCard. You selected MasterCard. Then American Express. American Express. You selected American Express. Then a default case if there are no matching cases. Let's echo. Please make a selection. So if I press confirm, we will echo. Please make a selection. If I select Visa, you selected Visa, you selected MasterCard, you selected American Express. All right, everybody. So those are a few different ways in which you can work with radio buttons in PHP. To get the value of a given radio button group, you can use the post variable, then access that key, whatever the name is. Then you can assign the value to a local variable to work with, and you can do whatever you want with it. In this case, I just used a switch. And well, everybody, those are a few different ways in which you can work with radio buttons in PHP. Well, hello again, everybody. In today's video, I'm going to show you how we can work with checkboxes in PHP. We need a form element. I have the action attribute set to my PHP file, index.php, for the method I'm using post. To create a checkbox, we can use a self-closing input tag. The type will be checkbox. And here it is. If we were to use post, we will get a key value pair from this checkbox element. The key will be equal to our name attribute. Let's say that the name is pizza. And for the value, let's say pizza. I'm going to capitalize the value just so that it's easier to differentiate between the key and the value. The name is the key, the value as well, the value. Then let's add some text. Pizza break element. Not sure why Google wants to translate this, but okay. Let's copy these two lines of markup, then paste them three additional times. The second button will be hamburger, the third will be hot dog, the fourth will be taco. Let's change the names, the values, and the text. The second checkbox is hamburger. Then hot dog. Then taco. Here are the four checkboxes. Then we'll need a submit button. Input type equals submit. For the name, that will be submit as well. Now within our PHP script, when I press this button, I would like to execute some code after we press the submit button. I will enclose all of my code with an if statement. We will check to see if our submit button is set. We'll use the is set function. We'll use the post variable. We are accessing submit. If we click the submit button, then do stuff. To check to see if a checkbox is set, we can use the is set function again. We'll use an if statement. If is set. Now we are examining the key of pizza. Whatever the name attribute is set to. If pizza is set, if it's checked, what do we want to do? Let's simply echo you like pizza. When I press pizza, click submit, we will display you like pizza. Let's do this with the other checkboxes. Let's copy this if statement, paste it three times. Then we'll check the other keys. We have hamburger, you like hamburgers, hot dog, you like hot dogs, taco, you like tacos. Oh, then let me add a break after each of these sentences because I forgot to do that. Now I can press any combination of these checkboxes. If one of these checkboxes is checked, we'll execute one of these if statements. 
You like pizza, you like hot dogs, you like tacos. Alternatively, we can determine to see if a checkbox is empty using the empty function. Let's copy our if statements. Change is set to empty. Empty, empty, empty. If pizza is unchecked, if it's empty, we'll echo you don't like pizza. Do this for hamburgers. You don't like hamburgers. Hot dogs. You don't like hot dogs. And tacos. You don't like tacos. If I were to click pizza and tacos again, then submit. You like pizza. You like tacos. You don't like hamburgers. You don't like hot dogs. That's one way in which you can check to see if a checkbox is set. You can use the isSet function to determine if it's set, or empty to determine if it's empty. You can place all of these checkboxes in an array, but they would all need the same name attribute. Let's rename the name attribute to foods for all of these checkboxes. Then add a set of straight brackets after each. These will all be placed within an array. Let's get rid of our if statements. After pressing the submit button, let's create a foods array. Then we will get via post the key name, which is foods. Foods is technically going to be an array. To prove it, let's echo foods, then see what happens. Pizza, hamburger, hot dog, taco. Warning, array to string conversion. So foods is an array. We can access elements of an array with an index number. Foods at index zero, that would be pizza. One is hamburger, two is hot dog, three is taco, four should be out of bounds. Undefined array key four. You can loop through all of the elements of an array using a for each loop. For each, List your array, foods, as food. Then let's echo each food. Then I will add a break. Pizza, hamburger, hot dog, taco. All right, everybody. So that's how to work with checkboxes in PHP. The type set to checkbox. The name attribute will be the key. And the value is, well, the value. You do have the option of placing all of these checkboxes in the same group. They would need the same name, then add a set of square brackets after. And well, everybody, that's how to work with checkboxes in PHP. Hey, everybody. In today's video, I'm going to explain how we can create functions in PHP. With a function, you write some code once, then reuse it whenever you need it. It's reusable code. If you ever need to call a written function, you type the function name, followed by a set of parentheses. For example, we could have an add function. We have a function name, then two parentheses. I like to think of the parentheses as two telephones talking to each other. In order to invoke a function, you call it, like with the telephone. Some examples of functions could be add, subtract, multiply, divide. You can create all sorts of functions to do various things. Here's how to create a function. We'll create a function to sing happy birthday. To create a function, type function, then we're declaring a function name. What would you like to name this function? I will name it the happy birthday function. Add a set of parentheses, a set of curly braces. Any code you would like to reuse, you place within the set of curly braces. I'll create some happy birthday song. Here's my function. We write this code once, then reuse it whenever we need it. If I would like to execute the code within the function, I would type the function name. In this case, it's happy birthday. Then add a set of parentheses, like it's a pair of telephones talking to each other. That's how you call a function. And here's my birthday message. Um, I forgot some break lines. Let me put those in real quick. That's much better. Happy birthday, dear you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear you. You are X years old. I know it's kind of a lame song. I just made it up on the spot. I can call this function as many times as I need it. 
If I would like to sing happy birthday three times, I would just invoke this function three times. There, we have sung three verses of happy birthday. I'm going to add another break statement, though. There. So a function is just a section of reusable code. You write it once, reuse it whenever you need it. With coding, we try not to repeat code if we don't have to. With a function, you can send your function some data, some values, or a variable. I'm going to send my happy birthday function a string, a first name. Let's say SpongeBob. If you send your function some data, a value, or a variable, this would be known as an argument. We need a matching parameter. A parameter is kind of like a temporary variable. Let's create a parameter named first name. This parameter only exists within the scope of this function. When you escape the function, this variable no longer exists. Let's replace u with a placeholder. Then we will add our parameter, our variable, first name. Happy birthday, dear, first name. Let's do that here as well. Then let's try this again. Happy birthday, dear SpongeBob. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear SpongeBob. You are X years old. I could call this function again and pass in a different parameter, like Patrick. We have a verse of happy birthday, but we have sent a different argument, Patrick, instead of SpongeBob. Let's do it one more time. We will invoke happy birthday, then pass in a first name Squidward. Happy birthday, dear Squidward. You can pass in more than one argument to a function. Let's send an age. So separate each argument with a comma. I don't know how old SpongeBob is according to the lore. Let's say that he's 30. Let's do that with Patrick as well. Let's say he's 35. Then Squidward, he seems older. Maybe he'll be 45. We have two arguments. When we invoke this function, we should have two parameters. For the second parameter, Let's store these values in a variable named age. Then we can use this variable for something. Let's replace x with variable age. Happy birthday, dear SpongeBob. You are 30 years old. Patrick is 35 years old. And Squidward is 45 years old. That's how to invoke a function and pass arguments to it. But you would need a matching set of parameters. Now with the function, you can return something. You'll typically see a return statement at the end of a function. Let's go over a different example. We will create a function to check to see if a number is even or odd. Function, let's name this function is even. We will need one parameter, a number. To invoke this function, you type the function name then add a set of parentheses. If there's a parameter, you need to pass in a value or a variable. Let's see if the number 11 is even. Now within our function, we need to write some code. Let's say we have a variable result. Result equals, then to see if a number is even or odd, you take that number or that variable, modulus two. Modulus gives you the remainder of any division. If number divides by 2 evenly, the result should be 0. If it's odd, the result is 1. Then we'll use a return statement and return some value. What would we like to return? Let's return the result. Now if I echo, after executing this function, whatever is returned kind of takes its place. Then I'm just going to echo it. Is 11 even or is it odd? That returns 1. Is 10 even or odd? That returns 0. It's even. You could shorten this too. Let's get rid of our result variable. Take this section of code, and we are returning whatever the outcome is. That works too. Let's write something a little more complicated. Let's create a function to find the hypotenuse of a right triangle. So let's define our function. Function. Let's name this function hypotenuse. We'll need sides A and B as arguments. So set up these matching parameters. To find side C, we need to follow this equation. Square root function, variable A to the power of 2 plus variable B to the power of 2. 
Then we will return whatever variable C is. I'm going to invoke this function, but we need two arguments, side A and side B. Let's say side A is 3, side B is 4. Now this doesn't print anything. C should technically be 5. So after executing this function, after it's complete, just imagine that we're returning 5. So let's echo whatever the result is. Or we could store it within a variable. So now the result is 5. Let's do two different numbers. Side A will be 4, side B will be 5. Side C is 6.4 and some change. One last thing I should mention, with your parameter names, you can declare a type that needs to be passed in. For example, if I was to send in like a string like, find the hypotenuse of pizza and taco, well, that really doesn't make sense, right? Fatal error, uncaught type error, unsupported operand types string. You can list a data type before the variable name to force the arguments to be of that data type. I could say these need to be integers. I would type int or float for floating point numbers. If I try this again, we receive a different type of error, uncaught type error. Now, I haven't discussed error handling yet, but this will come in handy when we get to that point. Just be aware that with parameters, you can list a data type beforehand. Then you would need to pass in an argument of that exact data type. All right, everybody, so that's a function. It's a section of reusable code. Whenever you would like to use this function, you type the function name, add a set of parentheses. If there are parameters set up, you would need to pass in a matching set of arguments. Then you can return something. And well, everybody, those are functions in PHP. Hey, welcome back, everybody. In today's topic, I'm going to explain a few useful string functions you might be interested in. Let's begin with creating a username. Assign this your first and last name. The first function I'll discuss is the string to lower function. I'm going to reassign our username and use the string to lower function. Then we will pass in our username as an argument. Then let's echo our username after we make it lowercase. Echo, username. There, my username is all lowercase. Alternatively, there's string to upper. String to upper. My name is all uppercase. Then we have trim. Trim will remove any white spaces before or after your string. There, there's the string pad function. We can pad a string up to a certain amount of characters with the character we specify. Let's say I would like to pad my username to a max size of 20 characters with zeros. Here's my new username. Or maybe we could use forward slashes or something. Then we have string replace. String replace. Within our string, we can replace one character with another. You know what, let's create a new variable. How about a phone number? Let's say phone. Phone equals, make up some phone number, 123-456-7890. Here are the order of arguments. What would we like to replace? Let's replace any dashes. That'll be the first argument. The second argument is what we're replacing the dashes with. Let's use an empty string. Then third is our string, or variable containing a string. We are reassigning our phone number. Here's a new phone number with all the dashes removed. Or we could replace them with something else, like a forward slash. That is the string replace function. Then we have string reverse. S-T-R-R-E-V. Let's reverse our username. Then echo our new username. There it is. It's all backwards. Then we have string shuffle. We can shuffle a string. Kdo bor. String compare. S T R C M P. We can compare a string or a variable against another string or variable. We'll assign this to a new variable. Let's say equals. So if these two strings are the same, then this function will return zero. If they're different, we'll either return one or negative one. 
think of it as if these two strings are the same, string compare returns zero, it returns false. So that's how to see if two strings are equal. Then we have the string length function, string length. Let's create a new variable count. How many characters are within our string? In my string, we have eight characters. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Let's do that with our phone number. Our phone number has 12 characters. That is the string length function. We can use the string position function to find the position of a character. With my username, let's find the first position of a space. The character or string you're looking for is the second argument. I'll create a new variable index. So the index of the first space within my username is three. Zero, one, two, three. Let's do that with our phone number. Then let's find the position of the first dash, which would be three as well. Zero, one, two, three. Then we have the substring function sub string. We can create a new string from a portion of another string. With my username, I'll take the first three characters and create a new string. I'll create a variable named first name. Here are the order of arguments. Take your original string, let's say our username. The second argument is the starting index. I would like to start at the beginning, the index will be zero. Then an ending index. I would like to end at this space in my name. But if you're using your own first and last name, you're gonna have a different position. So for me, I'd like to end at the third index. Then I will echo my first name. We have created a new string from an original string, but we have to specify the beginning and ending index. This time, let's take the last four characters. I'll create a new variable, last name. We'll use the substring function again. Username. Now you can list a beginning index and then don't specify an ending index. Then you'll create a new string all the way up to the end. If I set my index to be four, we'll create a new substring with everything after the index of four, no matter how long the string is. So let's echo our last name. And there is my last name in my example. So to get everything after the beginning index, just don't list a third argument. Okay, now we have the implode and explode functions. With your username, add your middle name or maiden name or whatever, or a nickname, doesn't matter, just something. We can use the explode function to assign each of these portions of our name into an array. Let's create an array named full name. We will use the explode function we are exploding our username. However, at which character or characters do we separate each element in our array? We'll do so by any spaces in this example. So that will be the first argument. Explode our username. Let's see if this is actually an array. Let's echo our full name. Warning, array to string conversion. So that's a good sign. That means that our full name is an array. You know what? Let's use a for each loop to demonstrate. For each, take our array full name as name. Then I will echo each name. There, here's my array. And I've taken each portion of our name and placed them as elements within a new array. Now we have implode, which takes an array and creates a string out of them, a single string. Let's say our username is an array. So type your full name. Then we will use the implode function. Username equals implode. What are we imploding? Let's implode our username. Then you can add characters between each element. I will add an empty space between each element when we implode it. And let's echo our username. Echo username. My array is all one long string now. Or maybe I can separate each element with a dash. It's still one string. All right, everybody. So those are a few useful string methods I think you might be interested in in PHP.
Hey everybody, what's going on? In today's video, I'm going to show you how we can both sanitize and validate user input in PHP. We're going to need an HTML form to work with. I'll go ahead and create that. Here's my form. We have a text box and a button. When I click on the button, we'll execute some code. I will enclose all of my code with an if statement. We will check to see if our login button is set, if it's interacted with. If set, we're accessing post. If our login button is interacted with, let's get the username from the text box and store that within a local variable. Then let's echo. Hello. Username. So I can type in a username, press login, and we are pretending to log in. If you don't sanitize or validate your user input, somebody could write some malicious code like a cross site script or SQL injection, such as this. You have a virus. What I did is just write some malicious JavaScript code to display you have a virus. It would be best to prevent code like that from running. One way in which we can do that is to add a filter to sanitize any user input. Instead of assigning our username directly from our post variable, we are going to use a function, the filter input function. And there are three arguments. The first argument is input post because we're using the post method. If we were using get, then this would be input get. The second argument is the name of the input, which in this case would be username. Then third is the type of filter. I'll put this on a new line because I'm running out of room. I would like to remove any special characters used in executing code. So there is a filter for that. It's filter sanitize special chars. I'm going to take this JavaScript code, paste it into my username, and we'll see if we can execute this code, which we cannot. Instead of executing the code, we are using it as output. And if I were to right click, then go to view page source, any special characters are replaced. Here is that JavaScript code I entered. It's not executing because we filtered the special characters. If you ever need to filter all characters besides numbers, there is filter sanitize number int. That's another filter. Let's create a new text box for an age. Age, the name will be age. So again, let's create a new variable named age equals filter input input post because we're using post the name of the input is age then the type of filter filter sanitize number int let's create a new message you are variable age years old if I were to type in blah, 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 and press login, we will filter all characters besides any numbers. That is the filter sanitize number int filter. Now maybe we need an email. Let's create a new text box for an email. Email, the name will be email. Email equals, again, filter input. The first argument is input post or input get if you're using get. The name of the attribute is email. The third argument is the type of filter. Filter sanitize email. Your email is variable email. I'll type in an email. Then add some illegal characters for an email, such as angle brackets and parentheses. 
and this should filter all of the illegal characters, which it does. Here's my email without those illegal characters. So those are a few ways in which you can sanitize input. Now let's validate input. Using a validate filter, if our input doesn't pass a validation test, it returns an empty string. Sanitization will strip certain characters of user input. Validation, if it doesn't pass, it just returns an empty string. So now we have variable age. Age equals, we'll use filter input again. Input post, because we're using post. The name of the input we're filtering is age. Then the type of filter. Filter validate int. If our user input isn't a number, we will assign an empty string to age. It doesn't pass the validation test. So let's check that. Let's use an if statement. We can use the empty function. If our age is empty, that means a user didn't type in a valid number. Let's echo. That number wasn't valid. Else, if our age is not empty, that means they typed in a valid number. You are age years old. Let's run this again. Uh, I'll type in a bunch of characters. Blah, 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 blah. I'll try and log in. Uh, that number wasn't valid. I'm not surprised. So now let's type in a valid number. And that seems to work. Using this filter, we can check to see if some input is only numbers. The next filter is to validate an email to see if it's in a correct format. Let's copy these two lines of code, paste them, variable email, input post. We are getting our email user input, filter validate email. If our email is empty, that email wasn't valid. Else, your email is our variable email. Okay, I'll make up some email. Press login, that seems to work. I'll type in that same email, but I'll add some illegal characters like angle brackets and parentheses. That email wasn't valid. All right, everybody, so those are a few filters you may be interested in. When accepting user input, it is a good idea to both sanitize and filter user input just in case a user types in some malicious script. You don't want any of that. Sanitize and validate your user input whenever possible. And well, everybody, that's how to both sanitize and validate user input in PHP. Well, 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 look who it is. In today's topic, I'm going to explain the include function. The include function copies the content of a file and includes it in your PHP file. A few of the benefits is that sections of your website can become reusable. Any changes only need to be made in one place. For example, we could create an HTML document for a header and a footer. Within each page of our website, we can include that same header and footer. That header and footer file become reusable. Here's an example. We will create a few files. Our index file will be our home page. Let's create one for an about us page. About.php another for locations, to list our locations for our imaginary business. Then we'll create an HTML file named header, header.html, then another named footer, footer.html. Here are the files we'll be working with. Let's fill in our header file. We'll create a standard header for a website. For our header, let's create a pair of header tags. I'll add a title. The title will be within a pair of h2 header tags. This is my website. Then we'll create a few links for a navigation bar. Let's set the first link to have an href attribute equal to our homepage, which we named index.php. Be sure to close it. The text will be home. Let's copy this link, paste it two times. The second link will be for our about page. Change the text to about, then locations, locations.php, then change the text to locations. I'll add a horizontal rule as well. 
That is good enough for our header. Let's head back to our index file. To use the include function within your PHP script, let me write that. PHP. All we have to do is type include, it's a function, then list the file name or the file path. These two files are in the same website folder. I only need to include the file name, header.html. Then when I save and reload everything, we have our header. Then I could add some HTML afterwards. So let's generate some HTML text. Within the body of my HTML, I'll add a few sentences. This is the home page. I'll add a break. Stuff about your home page can go here. Then let's add a footer. Let's go to our footer HTML file. I will use a pair of footer tags to create a footer. I'll add a horizontal rule. Let's say author colon space, type in your first and last name. Then I'll add a link for an email. At href equals mail to come up with some email. I'll add some text. Then close the anchor tag. That's good enough for our footer. Our footer and our header are now complete. Let me close out of those. We have our index page, our about page, and our locations page. After we display everything that we would like for the home page, let's display the footer. The footer belongs at the bottom of our web page. So let's copy our PHP script. After our HTML markup, let's include our footer, footer.html. There it is. Our header and our footer are reusable. We only need to write these once and we can reuse them for every web page. With our about page, let's generate some HTML. I'm going to copy these two lines of our body. This is the about page. Stuff about your about page can go here. I'm going to click on the link for our about page. But we don't have that header or footer. So let's add a PHP script before and after to include those. PHP. We will use the include function. We will include list the file name and or the file path header.html and there is our header. Do the same thing with the footer PHP. We will use the include function. We are including our footer footer.html and there is the footer of our web page. So now we can navigate between our home page and our about page. They're both two completely different pages. They have different text, but we're reusing the same header and footer. Okay, let's finish this with our locations page. I'm just going to copy all of this just to expedite everything. This is the locations page. Stuff about your location page can go here. Okay, let's click on our locations page. And we are now within the locations page. Again, we're reusing the same header and the same footer. Parts of our website are functioning as components. They're reusable. We don't need to create an individual header for every file, for every PHP file. We can write them once, then simply reuse them. The cool thing is too, if we need to make any changes, they'll be reflected across every web page. Let me change my email to at gmail.com. See, my email just changed, and that is reflected on every web page. It helps with code reusability. Then let's change our title. Let's go to our header. This is the type in your name. Bro code website. And that change has been reflected across all of our web pages. That is the include function. You can include the contents of a file inside of your web page. It helps with reusability. And if you need to make any changes, you can do so in just one place. And that is the include function in PHP. Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of cookies. A cookie, if you don't know,
basically speaking, it's information about a user stored in a user's web browser. That's why you might receive targeted advertisements, platforms such as YouTube, they might remember your browsing preferences, and you can store other non-sensitive data. Now, to create a cookie in PHP, we will use the set cookie function. It's actually pretty simple. Our cookies are stored as an associative array. First is the key. Our key will be favorite food. The second element is the value. My favorite food will be pizza. The third argument is an expiration time. Cookies typically expire after a certain amount of time. To set the time, we can use the time function, then add. This is in seconds. For one day, that would be 86,400 seconds. If you need your cookie to expire after two days, we can just multiply this by two. Then let me enclose these within parentheses just for clarity. Then the next argument is the file path. I'll use a forward slash for the default file path. And there we are. So I'm going to save this. Now, if we open up our web browser, I'm going to right click, go to inspect. You can find your cookies underneath application. Then go to cookies underneath storage. Oh, look at that. We have a cookie. The key is favorite food. The value is pizza. And there is an expiration date here too. There it is. Let's add a few more cookies. Set cookie favorite drink. I will set the value to be coffee. This cookie will expire after three days. There's our next cookie. One more. Favorite dessert. I will pick ice cream. This cookie will expire after four days. So 86,400 times four. There, we have three cookies. Favorite dessert, favorite drink, favorite food. Now to delete a cookie, all you have to do is set the time to minus zero. So let's do that for all of these. Yeah, look at that. The cookies are gone now. Yeah, let's revert that back. And we have cookies again. Let's print each key value pair from all of our cookies. I will use a for each loop. We are accessing the cookie super global variable. Our cookies are stored as key value pairs. Using a for each loop, we can write as key arrow value. I will echo each key value pair. Key equals value, then a break. Here are the three cookies we set. Favorite food equals pizza. Favorite drink equals coffee. Favorite dessert equals ice cream. To access one of the values, you would need the key. Maybe I will display an advertisement based on somebody's favorite food. Maybe we remember what their favorite food is. I will use the isSet function. isSet. Place it within an if statement. We will check within our cookies at the key of favorite food. If their favorite food key has a value, let's display it. Buy some, then let's access our cookie variable at the key of favorite food. Okay, else, echo, I don't know your favorite food. Our cookie for our favorite food is currently set. Let me get rid of this for each loop. If our favorite food key has a value that's set, we'll display an advertisement for their favorite food. Buy some pizza. If this cookie wasn't set, 
I'll let it expire by setting the time to minus zero. I don't know your favorite food. This cookie isn't set. We will execute the else clause. All right, everybody, so those are cookies. They are just information about a user stored in a user's web browser. These are used for targeted advertisements, browsing preferences, and other non-sensitive data. And well, everybody, that's an introduction to cookies in PHP. Hey everybody, how's it going? In today's video, I need to explain sessions in PHP because, well, it's an important topic. In PHP, a session is a super global variable that's used to store information on a user to be used across multiple pages. Once a session is created, a user is assigned a session ID. For example, these can be used for login credentials. Once you log into a site like Facebook, for example, you can visit different pages on that site and stay logged in. We'll do something like that with PHP. Let's get started. We have our index.php file, but let's create another. Our index page will be our login page. Then we'll create a PHP page named home, home.php. The idea is that once we log in with our index file, we will be redirected to our home page. So we have two PHP files now. To create a session, before you display any HTML, we will use the session start function. Within my PHP script, I will type session start, and that's how to start a session. Then after you start a session, then you can add any HTML. Let's generate some HTML. I'll add some text to our HTML page. This is the login page. Then I'll add a hyperlink for the home page. We'll use an a tag. Set the href attribute to equal home.php. This goes to the home page. Then be sure to close it. I'll add a break as well. Perfect. After our HTML document, let's add another PHP script. We can create name value pairs within our session super global variable. Let's create a key of username. Set this equal to a username of your choosing. Then let's do that with the password as well. So we will access our session super global variable. We will create a key of password. Then make up some password. For testing purposes, let's echo our username and our password. Echo session, we're accessing the key of username, then we will be returned the value. Then I'll add a break. Then do this with password as well. Let's see if this works. Okay, here's my username, here's my password. They are stored within this session variable but we can access the values with a given key. They're in key value pairs. I would like these values to be accessible from another page, from my home page. For demonstration purposes, I am going to echo our username and our password from our home page, but we need to create a PHP script. So PHP, then I will echo our username and our password. Let's see what happens. It's an experiment. So I'm going to save everything, on our index page, we have our username and our password. That works fine. But if I were to go to our home page, our second page, well, we don't have a username or a password. Undefined global variable session. Within any additional files that we create, we will also need to start a session with the session start function. And I'll just copy this. You'll need to do this before any HTML is displayed. We'll start the session. I'll create some HTML. I'll copy these two lines, but make a few changes to them. Okay, this is the home page. Then I'll create a link to our index page. This goes to the, we'll call it the login page. Let's reload this. Okay, this is the home page. This goes to the login page. We do have our username and our password. So I'm just switching between the home page and the login page. We can access our session variable from either page. 
as long as you start a session. For some additional practice, let's change our login page to actually reflect a login page. We'll have a text box for both a username and a password and a login button. So let's go to our index page. So this is the login page. Let's change a few things around. We'll create a form. Set the action attribute to equal index.php. For the method, since we're using credentials, we should use post. Let's say username, add a line break. I guess that can be a label too. We'll need a text box, input type equals text. For the name attribute, let's set that to be username. Add a break. Let's copy these two lines of markup, then paste them. Change the second username to be password. Also do that with the name attribute. Then we need a login button. Input type equals submit. For the name, this will be login. For the value, let's say that this is login as well. Then let's get rid of these lines. I'm going to minimize this Explorer window just so we have more room to work with. What we're going to do now is after somebody clicks the login button, then we'll assign our session variable. To check to see if somebody interacts with our login button, we can use the isSet function within an if statement. If isSet, let me scroll down a little bit, we are accessing our post variable at the key of login. If this button is interacted with, if it's set, we will assign our session variable. We'll create a key of username. We will assign whatever's within our text box for our username. In a real world scenario, I would probably use a filter, but just for learning purposes, I'm going to keep it simple and not use one. Maybe in a project we will. I need to access our post variable at the key of username. Whatever is in our text box, we will assign to our session variable of username. Then do that with our password as well. Before we log in, we have to check to see if our username and our password fields are empty. We could write, using an if statement, if not empty function, we are checking if our username is not empty. And... Let's check to see if our password is not empty. I'll put that down here. If our username is not empty and our password isn't empty, then let's assign our session variables. So for testing purposes, let's echo those values. Echo the session's username. I'll add a break. Then do that with the password. Password. All right, type in a username, make up a password. Oop, that should be a password field, hold on. Type equals password. There we go, here's our username, here's our password. If I were to refresh everything, type in either a username or a password, we shouldn't display anything, which is correct. If one of these two fields are empty, let's add an else clause. Else, let's echo missing username slash password. One of those is missing. Then I'll add a break. I'll type in a username, but not a password. Missing username slash password. Let's type in a password, but not a username. Missing username slash password. Let's type in both. And that seems to work. Now let's get rid of these echo statements. We no longer need them. We were using them for testing purposes. What we're going to do now is after hitting the login button, we will redirect our browser to our home page. There is a function for that. It is the header function. We'll add that right here after we assign our username and password. 
to jump to our homepage within the header function and within quotes, we will type location colon space, then the name of the page home.php home.php. Let's save everything. Make sure you're on your login page. I will type a username and a password. Press login and we are directed to our homepage. We are still maintaining that session. We have our username and our password still. Let's create a logout button. We'll do this within our homepage. Let's get rid of our hyperlink. We'll create a form that just has a button. So the action attribute will be home.php. For the method, let's use post again. I will add a button. The input type will be submit. For the name, this will be log out. For the value, that will be log out as well. We will use the is set function to see if our logout button is set. So let's use an if statement. If is set is our logout button set. We will access post. The key is log out. If this button is set, we will use the session destroy function. We would like to end our session if we're logging out. We will use the session destroy function to destroy the session. After logging out, let's go back to our login page, the index file. We will use the header function again. Set the location to be index.php. I will log out and that should bring me back to my login page. All right, everybody, that's how to create a session in PHP. You can store information about a user that can be used across multiple pages. And well, everybody, that is an introduction to sessions in PHP. Hey, everybody, today we will be discussing the server super global variable. It contains headers, paths, and script locations. It's an associative array that's created by the web server. It contains nearly everything you need to know about the current web page environment. To access the super global variable, you type dollar sign underscore server. Then you can access one of the key value pairs. So for this demonstration, I'm going to create a for each loop. We're going to iterate over all of the pairs, all of the key value pairs. Let's take our server as key arrow value. Then I will echo each key value pair key equals value, then add a line break. Let's take a look. All right, we have a lot going on here. Here are the key value pairs found within my server super global variable. We're still beginners. A lot of this is more for advanced PHP developers. I more or less just want to raise awareness that this exists. Two keys that we're going to be interested in are PHP self and request method. PHP self is the location of this page. The request method is either get or post. The default is get. If we have an HTML form that has the method set to post, after clicking the submit button, the request method would equal post. Let me demonstrate how we can use PHP self. I am going to create an HTML form. Let me get rid of this for each loop. The name of my PHP file is index.php. The action attribute of my form is set to index.php. Any information that's posted will be sent to my PHP script. However, if I were to change the name of this file, let's rename our file as home. Well, our action attribute isn't going to be updated. I'm going to navigate to our home page, localhost.website slash home. If I were to type in my name, then press submit, we're sending our form data to a file that doesn't exist. 
it would be kind of nice if we could update this automatically. That's where our server super global variable can come in. In place of a file name, let's write a PHP script within the set of quotes. We are going to access the server super global variable at the key of PHP underscore self. This key contains the value of the current file path for this file. Save and reload everything. You may need to navigate to our homepage because right now it's set to index. Okay, type in a username, press submit, and that should work. Then if we update the name of this file, let's rename it to um, start, I guess. That's all I could think of at the moment. Okay, let's navigate to start, start.php, type in a username, press submit, and that works just fine. That's how we can use PHP self to get the current file name. However, with PHP self, it is vulnerable to something called a cross-site script. We learned about cross-site scripts on the topic of sanitation and validation. If you do use PHP self, I do recommend enclosing this variable within a filter. One that I recommend is HTML special chars. So be sure to enclose that. That'll avoid any cross-site scripts. Just be aware that this is something you might see in the future in your own studies. At least you know what it is now. The other key that we're going to talk about is request method. Request method is either get or post. So if I were to reload everything but not submit anything, the request method by default is get. So another way to detect if a form is submitted is to access the request method. Normally we're used to saying if is set, then access post, then we access our submit button. One problem with this is that, at least in older web browsers, you can submit a form without hitting the submit button. There's ways around that. A more reliable solution is to take a look at that request method. Within an if statement, let's access our server super global variable. We will take a look at our request method and see if this is equal to post. If it is, then let's echo, I don't know, hello. Type in a username, it doesn't really matter, I guess. Hit submit, and we will display hello. In the future, I would prefer if we stuck with this way of handling post requests, just because it's more reliable. All right, everybody, so that's a basic introduction to the server super global variable. There's still way more advanced stuff involving it, but I thought I would at least give you an introduction just so that it doesn't freak you out in the future. We'll have a little bit more practice with this when we create our own login form. And well, everybody, that is the server super global variable in PHP. Hello, hello again, everybody. Today, I'm going to be explaining hashing in PHP. Hashing is the process of transforming sensitive data, such as a password, into letters, numbers, and or symbols via a mathematical process. It's kind of similar to encryption, but it's technically different. Basically speaking, we can hide sensitive data from third parties like hackers. In my example, I have hashed my password pizza123. This is what my hashing algorithm spat out. It appears to be what looks like a bunch of random letters, numbers, and symbols. We might store this in a database. Then in case that database is compromised, well then a third party wouldn't be able to see my original password. This is what the third party would see. In PHP, to create a hash of let's say a password, I'll create a password variable. Make up some password. Pizza123. I will create a hash variable then use the password hash function. The two arguments are a password, then a hashing algorithm. The second argument is technically a constant that specifies the algorithm. The constant we'll set is password default. If we set our algorithm to be password default in PHP, currently we're using the bcrypt algorithm, which is a very popular algorithm. This hash is what we'll be storing within a database. It's protected. If I were to echo my hash, this would be the result. Our password is what is referred to as plain text. We can plainly see what it is. Using the password verify function, we can compare a password versus a hash. 
If they're mathematically similar, then that password verify function will return true. Let's write an if statement. If password verify, then we'll pass in a password and a hash. Let's say that we get some user input. The user types in hamburger 666. Then the other argument is going to be our hash. Just imagine that we're retrieving this hash from a database. If our plain text password and our hash are mathematically consistent, then this function will return true. So let's echo. You are logged in. Else. Echo. Incorrect password. Okay, is hamburger 666 the same as our hash? Incorrect password. What about hot dog 1212? That is also incorrect. Maybe pizza 123. Oh, look at that. That's the right password. You are logged in. The password verify function will verify a plain text password versus a hash. If there's a match, we return true. If not, it returns false. That's really what hashing is in layman's terms. It's transforming sensitive data, such as a password, into letters, numbers, and or symbols via a mathematical process. And the purpose is to hide the original data from third parties. And that is how to hash a password in PHP. Hey, welcome back everybody. We have finally made it to the portion of the series where we will be connecting to a MySQL database. At this point in the series, you will need to be familiar with MySQL queries. I do have a full course on that on my channel for free. It's about three hours. But yeah, moving forward, we will need to know MySQL. There's two popular ways to connect to a MySQL database. The first being the MySQLi extension. This is what we'll be using. The other is PDO, meaning PHP Data Objects. Many developers prefer PDO over MySQLi because it can connect to more than just a MySQL database. I believe you can connect up to 12 additional databases, you know, Postgres being one of them. However, you would need to know object-oriented programming, which is an intermediate topic, and we have not covered that yet. As beginners, we'll stick with the MySQLi extension. It's procedural. All right, well, let's get started. We'll need to create a MySQL database within our XAMPP server. You'll need to open up the XAMPP control panel, which is this thing. Make sure that these two modules, Apache and MySQL, are both started. We will need to access phpMyAdmin, which you can do so by clicking on the Admin button next to MySQL. That should bring you to phpMyAdmin. Otherwise, you can just type in this web address, localhost slash phpMyAdmin. PHP MyAdmin allows you to configure your database. You can make SQL queries, monitor the status, export, import data. We'll be covering just some of the basics. To create a database, go to the Databases tab. We will create a database, come up with a database name. In the MySQL series, we created a database named Business DB. We'll stick with that, but you can really name it anything. Then we will hit this Create button. We can create a table, but we'll do that in a future topic. Let's be sure that that database is actually created. Let's click on our server, go to databases. Yeah, it's right here. To drop a database, you can check the database that you create, then press this drop button, but we don't want to do that. But that's how. There is some information we'll need about our MySQL server. If you go to user accounts, we will need some of this information, such as the host name, the username of root, if there's a password for the server, which there currently isn't, and that's about it. You can edit privileges too, but that's outside of the scope of this topic. All right, we have now created our database. So let's close out of phpMyAdmin. Make sure that your MySQL server is running. It currently is. I'm going to create a separate PHP file just to manage our database connection. So let's create a new file. I will name this database.php. Anything related to connecting to our database, we will handle within this PHP file. This will be a PHP script. We will declare a few variables. 
the first will be db underscore server. This holds the name of the server. For us, that was local host. Then db user, that was root. A password, db underscore password, I'll say just pass. We did not have a password, I will leave that empty. Then the name of the database, db underscore name. I named my database business db. Then we will declare a connection variable. We'll shorten this to con, meaning connection. I will set that to be empty. Okay, these are the variables that we'll need. To establish a connection to the MySQL database, we will take our connection variable, set this equal to the mysql i underscore connect function. There are four arguments within this function, the database server name, username, password, and the name of the database. Let's add these variables as arguments. So server, user, then password, then database name. Let me make some more room. I'll put these on a new line just for readability, but there should be no change to its functionality if I do this. If we establish a successful connection, this variable is technically what is known as an object. We haven't discussed object-oriented programming. It will represent our current connection. One of a few ways in which we can check to see if our connection is up and running is we can use an if statement then place your connection within the if statement. If a connection exists, let's echo. You are connected. Else, for testing purposes, let's echo. Could not connect. I will save and reload everything. Then go to your database PHP file localhost slash website slash database.php. You are connected, all right. I'm going to stop the MySQL server, then try and reconnect. We get this ugly error message. Fatal error, uncaught MySQLi SQL exception. For some reason, if we can't connect to our database, we don't want to display this error to the user. We should use some exception handling. We don't want to print any ugly error messages to the user. They will have no idea what's going on. I suggest when we attempt to create a connection, we surround this code with a try block. This has to do with the topic of exception handling. We can try some code that might cause an error, such as if we can't connect to our database. Let me just fix these. We will try and make a connection. If we encounter this exception, I'll copy it, we can take some other course of action. After our try block, let's add catch, parentheses, curly braces. Then add the name of that exception within the set of parentheses. In place of displaying this error to the user, let's echo a message such as could not connect, and I'll steal that here. I'll get rid of this else statement. So if we encounter this error again, we will display could not connect. That's a lot more obvious as to what's going on instead of that fatal error message. If I were to start the MySQL server again, then reload, we are now connected. This PHP file is now complete. Make sure to save everything. We're going to close it. I will head back to our index file. Let's generate some HTML after our PHP script. In the body, let's say, hello. Doesn't really matter what you say. Let me zoom in a little bit. Since everything related to our database connection is handled within a separate PHP file, we can include that within another file. Within a PHP script at the top of my index page, I will use the include function. We will include that file, database.php, to connect to our database. So let's see if it works. You are connected. Hello. Maybe I'll add a new line after. 
could not connect, I'll add a line break. Do that here as well. Much better. Technically, it's not necessary to tell the user that they're connected to the database. We were just more or less doing this for testing purposes. One way or another, though, we should let the user know if there's any problems with the connection. So we'll keep this for now. If I were to stop the server, reload, we have that message that says could not connect. All right, everybody. So that's how to connect to a MySQL server in PHP. All right, everybody. So in today's video, I'm going to explain how we can create a table using PHP MyAdmin. There's two ways to get here. You can either go to your XAMPP control panel, then press this admin button next to MySQL, or you can head to this URL. To create a table, let's go to our databases. We should have a database already created. In the last video, we created a database named BusinessDB, so let's click on it. Let's begin by creating a table name. I'll create a table of users. These will be registered users. Then set the number of columns. I'll stick with four. Then we will hit the Create button. In this column, we will set the name of each column. Our first column will be for user IDs. Let's name this column ID. We will set the data type to be int. We won't specify a length. If you would like a default value, you can set that here. We're going to use the ID field to be set to auto increment. You can set the characters, but we will keep that as the default. Like for some reason, if you need, I don't know, Greek, you can use Greek, but let's just use the default. To add an index, you can do that here. We will set our ID to be our primary index. Then I will click the Go button. To enable auto increment on a column, you can check the AI button. It's for auto increment. That should be it for this column. Let's create a column for usernames. The column name will be user. For the data type, let's say var char, then set a max size. I think 25 is good. For our users, let's have each user be unique. Then press go. Then let's move on to the next column. This will be for passwords. For the data type, let's set that to be char, which is right here. I recommend hashing passwords. In our database, we won't be storing plain text passwords in case, you know, we get hacked or in case somebody uses SQL injection. We'll be storing a hash of a password. I'll set the size to be 255. Encrypting and hashing algorithms are always changing and updating. Let's future proof our password field just by setting it to something large. Then let's add a registration date. Maybe we'll name the column register underscore date. Let's select not just date, but date time. I want to know the time that they register. For the default, let's use a current timestamp. That should be good for our table. If you would like some SQL code, you can preview the SQL. This is what we would be writing. But we're going to be doing this automatically with PHP MyAdmin. So let's save. And we now have our table. If I were to go to Browse, this is our table, but there's currently no rows. We'll be adding some rows with PHP, but for testing purposes, let's insert one manually using PHP MyAdmin. So we will insert some test values. With our ID, it's set to auto increment. We don't necessarily need to put in a value. For the user, let's say the user is Spongebob. And for the password, his password will be pineapple1. You can also encrypt this password using password hash. We'll cover hashing passwords in the next video. With our registration date, this is set to a current timestamp, so that's going to be done automatically. Let's press go. This would be the SQL query. But yeah, one row has been inserted. Let's go back to our table. The username is SpongeBob, password is pineapple1, and here is the registration date. Well, date and time. Then to delete a row, you can click this delete button, then press OK. And that is how to create a table in PHP MyAdmin. And in the next topic, we will be inserting some rows into our table using PHP. Hey everybody, in today's video, I'm going to show you how we can insert data into a MySQL table using PHP.
At this point in the series, I am assuming that you have already established a connection to your MySQL database. If you haven't, here's some code that will do that. In my index file, I have included the code to connect to my database. At the end of my script, I am going to close this connection just because I know for a fact I'm going to forget to mention that, so I'm doing it now. To close a connection, you can type my SQLI underscore close, then pass in the connection. Our connection is underlined because VS Code doesn't recognize it because we're including it from another file, but it should work just fine. Now what we're going to do is write an SQL query. I'll store that within a variable. SQL. This will hold our query. So within quotes, we can write some SQL query of your choosing. We'll do a basic insert. Insert into the name of the database, my database's users. Then list the columns. I will insert a username and a password. List the column, user, password. Then some values. We're going to start with just some plain text. My username will be SpongeBob. For my password, Let's say SpongeBob's password is pineapple1. Then to submit the query, we can use the my SQLI underscore query function. Then pass in our connection and our SQL query. And that's it. Again, VS Code isn't going to recognize our connection because we're importing it. If I were to run this query, then refresh PHP my admin. We have our submission. User ID of one. It's set to auto increment in this case. The user is SpongeBob password pineapple. And here's the registration date. I set the registration date to be a current timestamp. Yes, I am recording at two in the morning because I'm crazy. Let's say that for some reason we can't register a user. Maybe I forget a password. Well, we get this fatal error. Fatal error, uncaught MySQLI exception. We can surround our query with the try block. We can try this code. If there's any exceptions or errors that pop up, we can handle them gracefully. Let's create a try block. We will try some possibly dangerous code. Then handle any exceptions if they come up. If this query is successful, then let's echo user is now registered if we encounter a problem let's catch that the exception we're catching is this one i'm going to copy it paste it then we will echo could not register user Oops, got to fix that all right let's try this again my query is not technically correct, but we should be able to handle that exception. Could not register user, as you can see here. With our SQL query, let's insert some variables. Let's declare two. Let's declare a username. Username equals Squidward this time. And a password. Password equals clarinet2. With our values, within single quotes, we will list our variables. Username and password. Let's see if this works. User is now registered. Then if we head to phpMyAdmin, refresh this table, we now have an entry for Squidward with the password of clarinet2. Our passwords are plain text. It would be much better if we were to store a hash of a password, just because, you know, these are plain text. It's not secure. So let's hash our password. We'll create a hash. Equals, we will use the password hash function. The two arguments are the password and an option for an algorithm, we will use the default. Password default. 
technically we're using the bcrypt algorithm. That's the default currently. We will insert our username and our hash in place of our password. Uh, let's change the username though. Let's assign Patrick. His password will be rock3. Let's see if this works. Okay, refresh PHP my admin. And there is Patrick. User ID 3, username is Patrick. Here's the hash of the password and the registration date. All right, everybody, so that's how to insert data into a MySQL table using PHP. Hey, everybody, in today's video, I'm going to show you how we can retrieve data from a MySQL database using PHP. I have already established a MySQL connection. I'm going to include that file that establishes the connection. Then at the end of my script, I will close that connection with the MySQL close function. The first thing we'll do is write an SQL query. I will store that within a variable named SQL. In my table, I would like to select a user. Let's select SpongeBob. The query would look something like this. Let's select, let's say everything from our table, which I named users, where, if you don't write a where clause, your query is going to return more than one row. I'll show you how we can handle that later. Select all from users where user is equal to SpongeBob, but put that within single quotes. This is our SQL query. To make a query, we can use the my SQLI query function. We will pass in our connection object, then our query. SQL. If successful, this function will return an object. We will store that as a variable named result. So result is technically an object. Somewhere within this object, there's an associative array. To find how many rows are returned from our query function, we can place that within an if statement. We will use this function, my SQLI underscore num rows function. This function will return how many rows are within our result. Really, it should only be one in this example. If there's at least one result, we could write a condition such as if the number of rows is greater than zero, there's at least one matching row. To get that row from our result, let's store that within a variable named row. Set this equal to the my SQLI underscore fetch underscore asos for associative then pass in our result. This function returns the next available row within our object. Our row is an associative array. We can access this data by a key, then be returned one of the values. Let's echo our row at index of ID. Then I'll add a break afterwards. Let's see what we have. We have the user ID of one. Let's get the username. I think it's just user. One, SpongeBob. Then the registration date. Reg date. So these are the names of the columns. Yeah, here's SpongeBob's ID, his username, and the registration date. Those were the fields found within our table. Now, if there are no results, let's say we're looking for Sandy. Well, we don't do anything. Let's add an else clause. Else, let's echo no results found, or maybe no user found. No user found. That's how to retrieve one row from a table. What if you need to retrieve multiple rows? We can make some adjustments. We would want to utilize a loop. I'll enclose this line of code within a while loop. While there are rows, we will display each user's information. Let's get rid of the where clause. We will return every user. You would just need a looping structure of some sort to loop through each row within your result. 
All right, everybody. So that's how to query data from a database. You write an SQL query, use the query function. This returns an object. Then you'll need to get each row from the object. And then you can do that with this function. If you need to return more than one row, you can stick that within a loop, like a while loop. And that is how to query data from a MySQL database in PHP. Hey everybody, in today's video we're going to create a registration form in PHP, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. A few prerequisites that we'll need for this project is that we'll need a table within a database. We have created one in prior topics. We have an ID, a user, a password, and a registration date. You'll need a working database connection as well, which is what we have done here. In my index file, I have included that PHP code that contains my connection. Then we will write a second PHP script within this file. We are going to close our MySQL connection because if we don't do it now, I know that I'm going to forget later. So let's close it now. And we are closing our connection. Let's go to our index file. Generate some HTML. We'll create a pair of form tags. For the action, we're going to set this to a PHP script within quotes. Just in case I update the name of this file, this script will reflect the changes. So let's create a PHP script. We will get from our server super global variable PHP self. Accessing the key of PHP self, that will give us the name of the file. But this is vulnerable to cross site scripts we should enclose this within a filter. HTML special chars is a good one for this situation. Then we should set the method equal to post because we're creating a registration form. Let's add a title to our web page. Let's use an h2 header tag. Welcome to Fakebook. It's like Facebook, but worse. We'll have a user type in a username and a password. Username, add a break, add a text box, input type equals text. The name attribute will be username, add a break. And I'm just saving and reloading everything as I go along. We'll need a password. Create an input tag, set the type equal to password. The name will be password as well. Add a break. Then let's create a submit button. That is also an input tag. The type will be submit. For the name, let's set that to be submit as well. Then for the value, maybe register. That looks pretty good. Okay, our form is complete. Let's go to our PHP script. The method of our form is set to post. We can detect that with an if statement. We will access the server super global variable and check the request method key. So type request method. Is this equal to post? Has the request method changed to post? If a post request is made, we should filter both the username and the password just in case they contain a malicious script. So let's assign our username equal to, we will filter the input using the filter input function, type input post because we're using post. The second argument is the attribute name, username. Then a filter type, filter, sanitize special chars let's copy this line then paste it directly underneath but change username to password do that here too so that should filter any malicious scripts once we have a username and a password that's been filtered we'll check if one of these fields is empty we can use an if statement. 
Let's check if our username is empty. If empty function our username, then we will echo. Please enter a username. Else if our password is empty. Empty function. Let's check our password. Please enter a password. Let's test that real quick. I'll type in a username, but not a password. Please enter a password. I won't type in a username, but I'll type in a password. Please enter a username. If we type in both, nothing happens, but that's good. If our username isn't missing and our password isn't missing, we can execute an else clause. In our database, we'll want to store a hash of a password. Let's take our password, declare a hash variable, then use the password hash function. We will pass in our password, then an option. Let's use password default. Okay, now that we have our hash, we need to write an SQL query. We'll insert the username and the hash of the password. We'll store our SQL query within a variable, SQL. Then we will write the query. It's going to be an insert statement. Insert into the name of the table. In this case, my table is named users. List the columns, user and password. Values. List the values. We will be inserting our username variable as well as our hash, the hash variable. Then to initiate the query, we can use the query function, mysqli underscore query, pass in our connection as the first argument, followed by our SQL query. Once that's complete, we should probably let the user know that they registered successfully. Let's echo, you are now registered. For the username, I will type SpongeBob. SpongeBob will have a password of pineapple1. I'll click register. You are now registered. Let's go to our table, refresh. I might need to zoom out a little bit. And here's the first record, user ID 1. Username is Spongebob. This is the hash of the password. And I have a registration date. One important thing I forgot to mention, I'm only allowing in this table unique user IDs. If I were to register another user as Spongebob, we might have a little problem. Spongebob, I'll make up another password. FryCook2. Well, we get a fatal error. Uncaught MySQL exception. We have a duplicate entry for SpongeBob. We never really talked much about exception handling, but one way in which you could handle this exception is that we can copy the exception name, place any code that might cause an exception within a try block, then catch that exception. In this case, it was a MySQL exception. Then let's echo that username is taken. There's still a lot more you can do with exceptions, but that's more of a, an intermediate topic, I would say. Let's type in SpongeBob again. Fry cook two and register. That username is taken. Let's create the username Squidward. Squidward will have a password of clarinet2. You are now registered. And here's Squidward. All right, everybody. So I thought that would be a fun final project for us to do to wrap up this video. I would look at both object-oriented programming and exception handling next. Hey, if you made it this far, be sure you've smashed that like button. Leave a random comment down below and subscribe if you'd like to become a fellow bro.